Good evening, everyone. We are going to begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask all my colleagues to please unmute themselves and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States, States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which, for which it stands, it stands one, nation, one nation, nation under God. Under God, under God Indivisible, indivisible with, liberty, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. You know, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I would like to jump in and say so because I always feel subconscious at this moment. I come from a religious tradition that does not swear allegiance that way. We affirm, but we don't do it. So that's why I tend not to join in. So I apologize for not explaining that. In the past, I thought I could hide it better <laughs> at other times. But. Totally understandable. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, because this is a remote meeting, I'm going to ask Ms. Sullivan to please call the roll. Mr. James? Present. Dr. Coleman? Present. Dr. Rivera? Ms. Robinson? Present. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Present. Ms. Oliver Davila? Present. Thank you. All members are present with the exception of Dr. Rivera and Mr. Tran. Thank you. And they both have let me know they will be joining us late, a little bit later. Thank you. Tonight's meeting is being shared live on Zoom. It will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and posted on the school committee's webpage and also on YouTube. For those of you who are joining us on Zoom or at a later date, you can find tonight's meeting documents posted on the committee's webpage, bostonpublicschools.org forward slash school committee under the February 3rd meeting link. The agenda presentations and equity impact statements have been translated in all of the major BPS languages. Any translations that are not ready prior to the start of the meeting will be posted as soon as they are finalized. The committee is pleased to be offering live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and American Sign Language. After I finish asking the interpreters to introduce themselves, we will activate the interpretation icon, the globe which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Click the icon to select your language preference in order to access this feature, you have to update to the latest version of Zoom, and you can find that by visiting support.zoom.us. Our Spanish interpreters this evening, Mr. Bernal and Mr. Dominguez, if you could please introduce yourselves and invite our Spanish-speaking audience to switch to their Zoom channel in Spanish. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Juan Bernal. I am one of the simultaneous Spanish interpreters assigned for this meeting today. I will be alternating every 30 minutes with my colleague, uh, Mr. Randolph. <clears throat> I will now explain how to access the interpretation icon for those in need of interpretation in Spanish. Muy buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal. Soy uno de los intérpretes simultáneos asignados a la reunión de esta noche. Para poder accesar en español, <clears throat> tienen que buscar el icono que aparece en la parte baja de la pantalla. Parece un globo terráqueo, es como un círculo y van a seleccionar el idioma español para accesar la interpretación simultánea. Aquellas personas que tengan un teléfono celular buscan los tres puntos arriba del teléfono y seleccionan interpretación. Aquellas personas que no vean este icono tienen que bajar la versión más actualizada de Zoom. Van al www.zoom.us raya inclinada download. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Randolph. Go ahead. Hello. Good evening, everybody. My name is Randolph Dominguez. I am one of the simultaneous interpreters that I'll be working in tonight's meeting. Now, muy buenas noches, damas y caballeros. Mi nombre es Randolph Dominguez. Voy a estar trabajando junto con mi colega, el señor Juan Bernal. Como ya le fue indicado, vamos a estar alternando cada 30 minutos. Muchas gracias. Y buenas noches. Thank you. If our Cantonese interpreters, Anna C. and Terry Ying, could introduce themselves, and if you could please give Zoom instructions in Cantonese. 
Thank you. Um, 大家好，我系你嘅广东话同步翻译。诶，诶，我系 Anna， 同我嘅同事咧，诶 Terry 同我都会系诶今晚提供广东话同步翻译嘅。咁你喺你嘅诶诶荧光屏下面咧，就会见到一个地球仪噶啦。咁你咧一阵间佢打开咗嗰个同步翻译嗰个嘅功能之后咧，你就拣 Cantonese 广东话，咁我哋就可以为你提供同步翻译服务噶啦。Thank you, Terry. You're next. Thank you, Anna. 啊、uh, ，大家好，我名叫 Terry， 我係你嘅誒廣東話翻譯。咁好似 Anna 講啦，你可以喺屏幕下邊揾到個地球嘅圖標，咁你就可以揾到誒呢、呃这個翻譯嘅功能。咁你你就揀選廣東話 Cantonese， 你就可以聽到我哋嘅同步翻譯啦。多謝曬你 ，Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Yin. If our、uh, Mandarin interpreters Maple Zhu and Wei Li could introduce yourselves and also give Zoom instructions in Mandarin. 好。大家好啊，我是李伟啊，我跟 Maple 今天我们会作为你的啊同声传译啊，我们交替给你服务啊。如果你需要这个中文的同声传译的话呢，请在屏幕底部找到翻译图标啊，就是那个地球仪，然后选择你所需要的语言啊，首选项啊，你的话就是中文啊。如果您在计算机或者是智能手机上看不到此功能呢，啊，您可以去。啊，用以下的链接去更新最新的 Zoom 版本啊，也就是 Zoom 的这个拼音，然后点 US， 然后是斜杠，然后是 download 下载那个单词啊就可以。好 ，Maple。Hi, my name is Maple, your Mandarin interpreter. 大家好，我是今天晚上的另一位国语的翻译，我会跟伟每三十分钟一换为大家同传国语。那么就像伟刚才讲到的，请大家一会儿呢就会看到屏屏幕的下面会有。地球仪的图标，那么点进去之后呢，请你选择这个 Mandarin 的选项，国语，你就会听到同步的国语同传。Thank you. Thank you. If our Vietnamese Vietnamese interpreters、uh, V Phuong Lee and Duyen Tru, you could please introduce yourselves and provide Zoom instructions in Vietnamese. So, um, my name is Duyen. I'm Vietnamese interpreter. Uh, 先叫我 Vi. Tôi tên là Duyen. Tôi là người thông dịch Việt Nam. Nếu mà anh chị cần thông dịch, xin, ah, vui lòng bấm quả cầu ở dưới phải màn hình. Và nếu mà anh chị có, ah, cần phải có một cái zoom mới nhất để có thể, ah, tham gia cái chương trình zoom và có thông dịch, um, người Việt. Um, xin cảm ơn. Uh, v is just restarting her computer, so she's unavailable for the intro. Okay, we'll we'll come back to V when her when she's back up.、Um, I will now introduce our ASL interpreters.、Um, if you could also say hello,、um, Michael Hirschberg, Sarah Kuznetsky, and Jolanta Galloway. If you just want to say hello. Hi, I'm Sarah. Kuznetsky, the ASL interpreter. Thank you. And I'm Hi, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. I'm Michael,、uh, one of the other ASL interpreters. And I'm the third interpreter on the team. You'll want to. Thank you. Is、uh, V back up? Not yet. Okay. Thank you. Okay.、Uh, we will now activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen, and I just want to remind everybody that again we are having interpretation. So if everyone could、uh, please speak at a lower, a slower, sorry, slower pace to assist our interpreters, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you to everyone who signed up for public comment today. Sign up for both public comment periods closed today at four thirty. Ms. Sullivan will remind everyone about the public comment rules again later on. But here's a quick reminder for those of you who have signed up to testify: please make sure that you are signed into Zoom under the same name you used to sign up for public comment. You can use the Zoom tools to rename yourself so that committee staff are able to recognize you when it comes time to call on you. From this point forward, we're going to be asking all speakers to also identify what neighborhood they reside in. A 
along with stating their name and affiliation. This will give our members a sense of what we are hearing from our neighborhoods. This is also a practice across all public bodies in Boston. And thank you uh, in advance for your cooperation. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that uh, as we be begin our meeting this evening, Mayor Walsh has announced the appointment of a new member to this committee. The mayor has appointed Hernani Diarujo to join us on this team. Mr. Diarujo is a lifelong resident of East Boston and serves as the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and General Counsel at the East Boston Neighborhood South Health Center. He is also a graduate of Boston Public Schools, including the Bradley Elementary, the Umana Academy, and the Boston Latin School. I look forward to him joining the committee at our next meeting and introducing him further to the community. Before we move on with our agenda for this evening, I would like to say a few words about the important work that the committee is doing to shape the focus of our work for the next five years. At a series of recent retreats, the school committee selected two sets of measures from the superintendent's strategic plan that we will monitor closely each month. We know that the strategic plan was informed by a series of community engagement meetings and feedback sessions, and that the district's work and the superintendent's planning are both guided by the strategic plan, which the committee voted unanimously to approve over the summer. Based on the conversations during these retreats, the committee has identified a set of priorities from the strategic plan that represent the community's vision for what students should know and be able to do. We call these our goals. And from the strategic plan, we selected a set of non-negotiable community values that must be honored while we pursue the goals. And we call these our guardrails. We do this not to replace the strategic plan, <clears throat> but to heighten our focus on it, increase transparency and share accountability for student outcomes. We will spend time during upcoming meetings to review progress with the superintendent on the goals and to ensure that we are also following the guardrails. <clears throat> Excuse me. Through a series of data and other information, this committee and the superintendent will use our time during meetings to discuss these important matters. This new approach does not change the strategic plan or add new goals or guardrails to the district's work. Rather, it helps us reorganize and focus the work of the committee. Goals represent what students should know and be able to do, and the committee selected goals that focus on early literacy, achievement for English learners, achievement for students with disabilities, critical thinking with math, science, and literacy, and college and career readiness. Guardrails represent the community's values and our non-negotiable expectations that must be honored in all of the school systems work. The committee selected guardrails that focus on student voice and family engagement, community partnerships, equity and opportunity gaps, diverse and effective staffing, and social, emotional, and physical supports. When these guardrails are honored, they help create the conditions for student success system-wide. As our next step, the committee is going to hold a series of community stakeholder listening sessions to receive input from the community on the draft goals and guardrails. We're holding seven sessions in the next two weeks, including a student session co-hosted by BSAC. Each session will be co-facilitated by two committee members and interpretation will be provided. I wanna be really clear again about what these sessions are and what they are not. These sessions are to gather feedback from the community on the goals and guardrails that will guide our work for the next several years. 
They're not forums to discuss current issues such as school reopening and other matters. If you want to discuss those issues in the context of getting a resolution to a current issue, <clears throat> we have other venues for that. But to help improve our present, we have to make a plan for the future. And that's what we aim to do at these listening sessions. We're looking forward to these community sessions and we hope that you can join us. Our first session will begin this Saturday, February 6th from 10 to 11.30 a.m. To view a complete schedule, please visit the committee's webpage, bostonpublicschools.org forward slash school committee. Uh, and lastly, I just wanted to say that February is Black History Month, a time where we celebrate the accomplishments of Black Americans. And the fact is that Black history is part of America's history. And it's important for all Americans to know, learn about, and understand that. I believe that we need to make sure that an anti-racist best based American history be taught to all children, especially to our white children. I want to say that um, it's, a, it's a time in our history where it has never been more important to talk about the contributions of Black Americans, the contributions of everyone, but especially Black Americans. And I encourage um, families um, to watch WGBH has a whole month that is featuring 28 Black history makers in 28 days to teach about the lasting contributions of 28 incredible individuals. And you can find that schedule online. We're now going to move on to the approval of minutes from the January 27th committee meeting. And at this time, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes as presented. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, can you please call the roll? <clears throat> Dr. Coleman? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. The minutes are approved unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We're now gonna move on to the superintendent's report and I present to you our superintendent, Dr. Brenda Caselius. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to all of the school committee members. Um, I'm excited about our new member um, joining us. And I also wanna just give a special shout out to our interpreters who are here with us every week and do such a wonderful job and our translators who translate the materials. Um, and of course, all of our office staff um, in the school committee office. I just feel like oftentimes I'm thanking the team and I, I don't get a chance to personally thank them for all the work they do in the background as well as our technology team. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on what will be our most important presentation of this school year. Um, and also start off with a couple of data highlights. As you know, I've uh, worked with my team to restructure my superintendent's report um, based on our school committee retreats uh, with AJ and um, looking at really focusing on student outcomes and the work behind the scenes that we are doing um, with our data dives. So we've um, talked over the few uh, past weeks about our efforts to improve our systems and better coordinate supports for students, families, and, um, and our teams. And uh, Mr. Harris was on talking about Panorama and I wanted to do a little bit of a deep dive with that. So we're actively implementing a new uh, software program called Panorama Student Success. Panorama Student Success is a unified system that allows us to analyze individual student data it allows us to co collaborate and problem solve remotely and also monitor our interventions to determine their effectiveness and assess issues of equity. Here you'll see two graphs, one on the left, you'll see that the percentage of school staff who logged into Panorama steadily increased from 38% in September to 50% in January. Panorama allows multiple data points to be viewed side by side and has success plan capabilities. It offers better opportunities for collaboration on the team members in pursuit of equitable outcomes for every student. 
On the graph on the right, you will see the percentage of students on track in attendance by grade level as of February 1st, which is the school year to date. On track means students whose average daily attendance is greater than 90%. This data demonstrates the trend of students and their attendance being highest in grades two through five and lower in the early education grades and middle high school level. If you recall from last meeting, I shared with you the trajectory here of how our lower uh, grade students and our upper grade students are outliers in uh, having a greater challenge. Educators can use this panorama and our school support teams to create plans and develop supports and services for students with low attendance. Um, the management software affords us the opportunity to be more systemic and coordinated in our efforts to improve student outcomes. Outside of student attendance, they also uh, write plans for social emotional well being and also academic plans. Here you'll see a quote from a BPS educator about using Panorama. Panorama allowed me to quickly learn more about my students and the culture of the school, historical attendance reports, and also uh, coupled with family survey results, which allowed me to plan over the summer versus needing to start fresh. The, su the support notes function also promotes a collaborative culture around staff. I wanna thank our Office of Data and Accountability for moving this important work forward in collaboration with our school leaders. As you noted, Madam Chair, it is Black History Month and this, this month we'll be celebrating Black History, but we also celebrate it throughout the all year. I mentioned in my check-in to staff this morning that this year things are a bit different. We're coming off a really challenging year that saw a renewed social justice movement and a long overdue racial reckoning that sadly had to come after the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, and numerous other injustices against Black people. This month, we celebrate Black excellence, teach and appreciate Black history, and continue working toward a more just future. I wanna thank the Division of Academics and the Division of Equity Strategy and Opportunity Gaps for partnering to create a calendar of resources and events for a year long celebration of our blackness. We encourage staff to submit school and community events, resources for educators and work on an internal website. We've also created a Black History Month page on the BPS website with additional resources and events for the public. And that's available at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash forward slash BHM. Next week, we also kick off our third annual 27, 24 seven respect week. This year, all BPS students in grades six through 12 will watch and discuss the BPS Office of Equities video 24 seven respect produced in partnership with Boston Arts Academy and the Boston Student Advisory Council. As you recall, you saw this uh, clip when the equity office uh, gave their presentation a few weeks ago. Middle and high school students across the district will learn how to prevent and address bias-based incidents and sexual misconduct, whether in person during Zoom instruction by text or on social media. Yesterday evening, I shared a letter with families of students in grades six through 12 with information about the week's programming. The 24 seven respect program gives students a chance to become active participants in the shaping of their culture and their environment so that all students feel seen, heard and valued and have the opportunity to learn, grow and thrive. We are proud that the 24 seven respect video won two national awards, including a prestigious Telly Award. This BPS program has had significant impact on our school communities and now school districts across the country are using it. Again, we played a clip of this video just during our annual equity update to the committee just a few weeks ago. And I know that many of you uh, commented on this uh, afterward. The video is available in both English and Spanish, and you can find much more information about this program at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash 24 seven respect. I'm also grateful to Assistant Superintendent Becky Schuster and BPS Office of Equity for consistently teaching our students and all of our community members the importance of respectful communication. 
And thank you to the Boston Arts Academy and to our BSAC students for taking a leadership position with their peers and continuing to communicate student rights and responsibilities. Talking about students, last week we shared information about our Posse Scholars. And this week, I'd like to mention another BPS senior heading to college next year, our student representative, Kimani James. He shared these photos with me via text just yesterday. He recently visited Columbia University where he will be a freshman next year and look who he's with. Our previous student representative, Evelyn Reyes is currently in her first year at Columbia. I'm so happy for both Kamani and Evelyn and it warms my heart to know that they will both attend the same university next year. We've seen Evelyn pass the torch to Kamani in more ways than one and I'm so proud of both of them. Finally, I'd like to speak a bit about school safety. Last week, we had the opportunity to discuss the department's ongoing work as part of the reopening update with a presentation from Chief Neva Coakley Grice. I appreciate the conversation that the presentation generated with the committee, and I know that Chief Coakley Grice and her team continue to deepen their relationships in schools, with our staff, with our students, and our overall community which is going to be critical as we welcome students to in-person learning starting tomorrow. Under Chief Coakley Grice, Boston Public Schools is working toward a reimagined school safety team, starting with changes to the name of the department from the school police department to our school safety team and updates to their uniforms, adopting more restorative justice practices and implementing new professional development training for our officers. I know from many stories that I've heard recently that there's a new sense of a renewed collaborative spirit throughout this pandemic um, and under Chief Coakley Grice's leadership and that our school safety officers are integral members of the school communities that they serve. Many of them are graduates of BPS and so many of them have many, many years at their schools and deep relationships with our families, with students and with, within the whole entire community because they often coach sports teams, they serve as mentors, and they focus on getting to know the students, teachers, and staff who report to schools every single day. Chief Coakley Grice and her team are at the forefront of implementing the new student uh, privacy policy that this committee adopted this past fall, a role that I know Chief Coakley Grice has prioritized. I'm happy to report that the policy is working and we have trained our safety team and we are complying with it. Additionally, I want to thank our school safety officers who have been active since March 2020, supporting food service staff on access to meals for our students and their families and participating in deliveries to our families who, um, who need, need help and who have helped to deliver Chromebooks and PPE to our students. Our priority is to create joyful, welcoming and safe learning environments for our students and staff in every single school. Our school safety team members will continue to contribute to that work by building and deepening relationships, listening and learning, and taking a student's first approach to their work, all while being trained to keep us safe. In related news, last week I promised to announce the members of the school safety working group charged with further discussing issues related to the policy regarding preparing and sharing student incident reports and other student information with the Boston Police Department. I'd like to name some of the members or all of the members of the working group. Devrin Edward is a student at Boston Green Academy, a student athlete and a BSAC representative. He's a member of the BSAC School Climate Culture Committee and Improvement Subcommittees. Josie Colon is a new Mission High School student who is participating in this working group to become more aware and active surrounding the policy work surrounding incident reports. She is a debate captain at New Mission High School and a BSAC student re representative. Suleika Soto is the mother of two BPS students, one at Tech Boston Academy and one at Blackstone Elementary. Suleika is, um, was enrolled in Boston Public Schools at Sumner Elementary when first arriving in Boston from the Dominican Republic at age seven. Elizabeth McIntyre is a senior attorney in Greater Boston Legal Services School to Prison Pipeline Intervention Project. 
Ms. McIntyre provides legal support and representation to the student organizers and collaborates with organizations across the state to engage in systemic education policy advocacy and litigation. Nora Paul Schultz, Schultz is a physics teacher at John B. O'Brien School of Math and Science. In addition to teaching physics and AP physics, she is the club advisor for the student immigration movement chapter at the O'Brien. The Muslim Students and Allies Association and the FIRST Robotics team. She is also one of the leaders of Unafraid Educators, BTU's Immigrant Rights Organizing Committee. Terrence Johnson was born and raised in Boston. He's a proud product of the Boston Public Schools, is a graduate of Madison Park Technical Vocational High School, and is now the assistant principal. Throughout his 26 years at Boston Public Schools, he has always pushed for safe, equitable, and sustainable urban schooling by knocking down systems of inequality in education. He is interested in this particular working group because he knows that tangible outcomes occur through policy change. Javier Flores is a attorney interested in participating in the, partic in the working group to ensure the effective implementation of the information sharing policy and to ensure that all Boston students, irrespective of citizenship status, feel safe uh, pursuing their education within our school system. Dacia Campbell is currently assistant superintendent in the Boston Public Schools Division of Accountability. Dacia is committed to ensuring that BPS is implementing the policy correctly and supports our students by protecting their privacy and not supporting the school to prison pipeline. Harold Miller Jr. is currently Interim Assistant Superintendent in the Office of Opportunity Gaps and has served Boston Public Schools since 2001. Mr. Miller has worked in the Office of Opportunity Gaps since 2016 and has made notable contributions to the entire district through his career. Mr. Miller is currently responsible for developing and implementing system level policy, professional learning and coaching and innovative programming. Jack Sinnott is a past chair and current board member of SPEDPAC. He also served on Mayor Menino's Autism Tax uh, Policy Task Force, the father of three children with IEPs, one autistic and two with ADHD. His personal experience of the critical role ab abstract institutional policy plays for good or, or ill in the, in the day and life of a child has been central to his life and work ever since. Neva Coakley Grice is current BPS Chief of Safety Services Chief Coakley Grice has spent her entire professional career working in Boston, starting as a Boston police officer in South Boston, where she cherished her time working with students at the former Gavin Middle School and Tynan Elementary School, and has been a leader in community relations. Angelica Martinez from the East Boston Ecumenical Community Council and Valeria Duval, lead coordinator of the student immigration movement complete the working group. We have our first meeting scheduled for the evening of March 3rd. In addition, we have two orientation sessions next week for working group members to introduce the members, review the policy and the charge of the working group and cover the future meeting schedule and answer any questions that they may have. And with that, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Superintendent. I will now open it up to questions and discussions from the committee. So if you could raise your hand virtually or in your box. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Um, thank you, Superintendent, um, for your report. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I was, I guess, surprised and not surprised to see the attendance issues from grade to grade and um, wondering what are our efforts, you know, that we would have, you know, the, 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 the best attendance amongst grades two to five, but drop-offs in middle and high school as well in elementary, are there particular efforts schools or teachers are making around trying to get that to improve or do we understand why those kids are just not attending in ways that they should be? Yeah, good question, Ms. Robinson. If you recall, uh, Mr. Harris brought forward a few uh, meetings ago, pretty extensive right. follow-up on what we're doing for students in attendance and our, uh, our um, student um, attendance officers are really working on following up as well as our roundup to kindergarten, our kindergarten mm -hmm. roundup 
folks going um, and working and trying to reach families. We've been hunting down the email address and um, phone numbers of those. So our ombudsman office has been working on that as well as our schools and teachers have been calling and working as well. Um, and that's where the documentation and this new panorama system is very helpful. So we can see all of the efforts that we're taking. Um, as you know, um, cause we've shared the dashboard before all of this is available on the dashboard where we list the daily attendance rate as well as the engagement rate online and we're at about 90% attendance, daily attendance and 88% online uh, engagement. But what we showed you here with the panorama is mm -hmm. those who are, who are attending 90% and greater. So um, it's a different measure in how we're cutting the data and looking at so that we can get after chronic um, attendance mm -hmm. and, and pre uh, preventative measures early on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My, my next question is just a quickie. It's, it's with respect to those wonderful um, Respect Week videos. I know they're available in English and Spanish. Will there be efforts to get them translated into other languages as well? Yes, so um, I know that uh, Ms. Schuster mentioned uh, when we, she did her presentation that we do have them available now um, in orally in Spanish and also in, um, in English and that she's working to get them transcripted in other languages. Okay, and this my last question is one, as we move away from the title of school police to school safety officers, I was noticing on the cards, it still says school bus and school police. Would that be something that would be changed as well, moving that's, forward? That's a very good um, suggestion. I will bring that to back to the team. All righty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Dr. Coleman. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Casella. This is a great report. Really, really appreciate the detail. And like Mrs. Robinson, I particularly appreciate the use of data, putting up front and allowing us to ask specific questions about what's happening and your answers were satisfying to me. Um, I would just, as we move forward in this, I know Panorama is new, but I think it's going to be important for us to in, in have uh, yearly trend data as well as uh, media data, because you know we know we have a very difficult uh, ship to turn around and 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 improve its performance, and so seeing those trends is going to be critical. And that that to me is those are valuable part of the reports. I know it's important to share individual events and new processes and keep us informed. But that's as as we move to an outcome based um, focused district, that's exactly the type of presentations that I find most valuable. So thank you very much for uh, leading the way on this. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Dr. Rivera? Yes, uh, thank you again, um, Superintendent, for the report. Um, just two quick questions. Um, regarding the school safety police officers and the, the, the working group, um, will they also be exploring the, the use and potential removal of metal detectors in, in the schools? So when we met as a group, um, the chair was also a part of that group and we had committed to the group to really look at some of the other measures. This, this group is looking at the data um, more and monitoring the policy and there needs to be some further work that, that is around kind of our um, policing reforms. And I hope to get that started. We've just uh, been opening and reopening. And um, so we've been somewhat distracted from that since December but uh, I hope to get to that uh, in the future, but this that's not the charge of this group. Okay, um, so which, so will there be another group looking at that issue? Yeah, I'll need to convene a, a group to look at that with Chief Coakley Grice around, um, you know, just our reforms that we're doing. Okay, thank you. Um, I had another question um, uh, regarding the, the panorama data. Is that also going to be part of the dashboard? Like, is that going to be linked in or is this a separate thing that I'm just curious um, with the new data dashboard, is this information also going to be triangulated and present there? Yeah, there. Uh, good question, Dr. Rivera. There are many dashboards that we use. Uh, this public dashboard that we have um, is giving some basic data out of Panorama. What we need to do is move toward the entire district using Panorama. As you know, we piloted this new software this past May. 
um, and asked our, uh, our uh, school leaders to work with it. Then we um, asked them to sign up this fall and we have, we have pretty good participation. Um, and so it's really moving toward a more comprehensive um, approach to having all of our schools signed on to use uh, this panorama so that we can have good data and put it in a dashboard and have all of our schools represented in there. Uh, currently not all schools are using it uh, as a tool because we're still in the cycle of getting schools on, on using it. Um, and we, had, we don't have a policy yet requiring every school to use it. So as these dashboards become more sophisticated and you know, just they disaggregate the data, um, we can add um, more information like chronic, uh, chronic uh, absences to the, to the dashboard as another indicator. Um, so I will bring that back to the team um, around you know, which indicators do we want on here? How do we wanna to continue to expand this dashboard? Um, and what, what's useful to the public um, in terms of our own goal around transparency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Um, Vice Chair O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Superintendent, for your report. Uh, Ms. Robinson, I also noticed the um, cars that said school police and um, images matter, right? And yeah. Mr. James has been pointing out to us the perception of students of our school safety officers and how important that is. So as superintendents, you talk about changing uniforms and everything, I, I think changing the cars and, and looking at the, the visual imaging, um, the actions and the presentations are critical. So um, thank you for your uh, openness on that. Um, I, like my colleagues, was struck by the panorama um, data and was not surprised because it is in line with what, you know, we're seeing in, in many, many districts and can almost understand the, the early students because, um, the early year students, because how hard it is for them to stay engaged. But I am concerned, and I assume you are a superintendent about our high school students, and I, and I was wondering if we could unpack that a little bit more. Um, certainly understand, and Mr. James has been helpful pointing this out to us, um, which is why it's so valuable to hear his input about, you know, um, students working jobs, students working projects, students working in groups that don't necessarily tie to this, other family commitments. Um, but I'm also nervous about our, our students, particularly our juniors and seniors. And so I'm wondering, not only attendance, are we also tracking or can you track superintendent, for example, how many interactions they have in with their guidance counselors, as an example. I'm thinking through here, we're celebrating Mr. James getting into uh, Columbia early and seeing the pictures with Ms. Reyes. Talk about a great, uh, you know, we've been blessed over the years with many excellent uh, student representatives. Um, so congratulations on that, Mr. James. Love to see the picture with your predecessor and, and hope to hear about that in your report. But, um, you know, a lot of our students are struggling with applying to college, thinking about college. They're not having their interactions beyond uh, attendance. So. How do we unpack that a little bit more, Superintendent? I'm sure it's a big concern of yours right now. And how, to, and particularly since our high school students under any schedule we have for reopening, our high school students are gonna be the last to, to get back to in-person. So how do we address what clearly is a very, very troubling set of statistics from nine through 12? Yeah, I appreciate all of these questions. You know, it is really troubling to see on both ends, right? That's what I was saying in my superintendent report. Our little ones, you know, K, K1, K2, first graders, and then our older students, our upper school students, just really struggling um, in this remote environment, which makes it even, you know, more, more necessary to get our schools open. Um, and, um, you know, it's been a whole year now and uh, almost a year and and you know that's just it's just uh heartbreaking to see that um we can track um number of times that students are um seeing their guidance counselors and and number of behavioral health sessions and social work sessions and different supports that have been given to kids the trouble is is that we have many of our schools who use different systems and so we're trying to get it all on this one system so that we can 
better know where the effort is and where we can triage and intervene and develop plans for um, support. So that's what this panorama is for. And that's why I shared it with you today because it is really an important tool for us to be able to um, make these interventions and support plans that are gonna be necessary as we enter recovery. Um, so that's why I wanted you to get a, a deeper look into that. So I could, uh, for my next superintendent report, uh, dive deeper into attendance uh, and um, support systems that we have mm -hmm. in support planning, if, if you would prefer, um, and have that be my data slide next time. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair O'Neill. Um, I share the sentiments of concern around um, the high school students and wonder how we can also work more closely with our out of school time partners. And um, just wonder if there are any ideas from the from BSEC or from your um, advisory group superintendent on you know, ways we can better engage students. I am concerned about the social isolation and um, as we've heard across the country, some real serious things happening with high school students, some devastating things. So I, I definitely worry about that. Um, and I would like to hear more about that. Um, and Mr. James, when you, when you said you were going to New York and when we were emailing, I didn't get it. Duh. <laughs> so I saw the pictures. Uh, so that's so nice that you got to go and you got to, um, hang with Evelyn that that was uh thank you for sharing those photos superintendent that was, that was really nice to see that um I want to congratulate uh the team on the tele award I think that's awesome um I had a question about um I don't know panorama well I was curious if panorama in any way interacts with families or with out-of-school time providers is there anything of that nature or is that just too far too far-fetched there. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the first one about out-of-time providers, um, uh, Madam Chair, and I think we can do more of partnering. I, I think you're gonna see these types of investments in our budget that we'll be presenting tonight with family liaisons, um, with the types of supports for recovery that we're hoping to do with partnerships. So I think that you're going to see that in our presentations, our social workers who are our connectors, also to resources throughout the city. Um, our budget that we will be presenting tonight is going to answer a lot of the questions that you have about supporting our kids, um, especially in the upper grades, which I'm really excited about. What have the students told me um, will work for them? Here's what I hear from BSAC members and from my youth cabinet. They like small groups. They like mm -hmm. when um, there's the opportunity for them to meet in small peer-led groups um, throughout the day. And that uh, feels good to them and that they're able to connect with their peers. Um, they like a later start. They don't want to be getting up at 7.30 in the morning. You know, um, they want to have later start. They also want more frequent breaks throughout the day. They think that this constant you know, back-to-back -back mm -hmm. classes is um, a struggle for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want flexible schedules um, so that it accounts for if they have to work in the afternoon um, or if they're helping their family uh, with a job or if they're helping their younger sibling uh, because the parent uh, is working, uh, that there's um, time built in for them to have uh, flexible scheduling and to do projects. We've heard from uh, uh, Mr. James about grading practices. Um, they want the grading practices and they want homework to be meaningful and to be um, part of their, um, their courses. And they want more time to be able to turn things in and not have so many deadlines for work or they want teachers to collaborate together so that they're not piled on uh, uh -huh. at the end of a semester or quarter um, and trimester where you have you know, six teachers giving you, you know, all this heavy work at one time. Um, and then in terms of their overall um, attendance, you know, they want to see, you know, fair attendance policies. So, you know, they've, they've told me that, you know, this three times that you're unexcused is just not, it's just not reasonable, um, especially if you're getting the work done. 
Um, so they want to be they want to be uh, judged by the work that they actually turn in and not by participation grades or attendance or other things. So that's the feedback that kids have given me and um, they just really are quite wise and I love my time with them. They are and so hopefully we can implement some of those and then moving into you know when we're in person also again taking our learnings and using those during you know a regular school year. Um, I also I have to answer one more question that you asked about parent side of Panorama. We don't have a parent side to Panorama. However, our family liaisons and will work on the student support team, and then they can work to work with our, with our parents on the planning. Great. I only have 20 seconds more, so I will only just um, say that um, I agree with your comments, um, and I'm glad to see around um, Black History Month shouldn't just be a month. I, I always I always find it really hard because want to acknowledge, but also not trivialize that it's a month. I feel annoyed, you know, with the one month celebrations of anything. So I'm really glad to see that, um, and I'm really glad that we're going to, you know, have ethnic studies because I think that's really important. So thank you, uh, Superintendent, for your report. Uh, and if there's no further discussion, I will entertain a motion to receive the Superintendent's report. Madam Chair, is uh, Mr. O'Neill's hand up and Mr. Coleman, or they didn't take oh. them down? Oh. You, had, you had it up again, sorry. Dr. Coleman, go ahead, I apologize. No, no, I, no, no, I, 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 I didn't take it down. I apologize okay. for not nope, being on no top problem. of the, the etiquette. And so moved, by the way, so moved. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Coleman. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, can you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. The superintendent's report is approved unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And before we move on this evening to public comment, I would like to invite our student representative, uh, Kimani James, to present his monthly update. Mr. James. Thank you, Chair. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I want to say happy Black History Month in the spirit of celebrating Black individuals both past and present for their accomplishments and Black excellence. I want to remind everyone that our work must also uplift and be centered around Black and Brown students always, and that it is way overdue to implement Black history into our curriculum with a social justice framework in our classrooms. Now that will be commemorating Black individuals and students all year round. And quickly to Mr. O'Neill's point about the lack of engagement in low rates of attendance from our high school students, particularly juniors and seniors, there needs to be structural reform to alleviate the stress of our students so they feel more comfortable going to class. This means everything from abolishing the punitive grading system, something I spoke with Andrea Zayas about yesterday, to letting our teachers know that we must be more mindful of students' time and personal endeavors, which brings us back to the dilemma that I always bring up, quantity versus quality. I would love to explore some of these ideas and solutions more during the questioning period afterwards, because sometimes it feels as though we're talking about what we want to see and not actually taking action on them. Secondly, I want to thank the superintendent for her kind remarks on Evelyn and I's journey to Columbia. On my visit to Columbia this weekend, we did everything from touring the campus, eating delicious food, to speaking about our current challenges in our respective social justice positions and what we can do to sort of overcome those. Evelyn and I, we talk almost every other day and she's become a very close and dear friend of mine over the past year. Um, and I've actually decided that I will be joining a program at Columbia called Youth for Debate next fall, where students at Columbia get to work closely with New York City public school students to challenge oppressive systems through public discourse, working on their public discourse and overall improving their schooling system. I do want to let the public know that um, I did take the precautions to um, get tested for COVID before traveling 
to New York City and I did test negative um, and I did follow social distancing guidelines in the um, city of New York. And upon my arrival, I have been quarantining with my family and do plan to take a test in the next day or two. Um, this is just a reminder to the public to please mask up. The CDC has come out this past week and has said that double masking is actually more effective, especially with the new strain that is circulating um, around um, the country and around the world. So definitely mask up, double mask up, and be sure to follow social distancing guidelines and keep yourself and others safe. Um, now on to my um, BSAC report um, for the Environmental Justice and Sustainability Subcommittee, an overview just in case anyone does not know. Um, it, this subcommittee is for improving our environment and taking on climate change. Um, this team is planning to meet with Catherine Walsh in order to plan for Earth Week within the district. They're planning to see if more teachers could implement the climate curriculum into their classes in that week of April. They are trying to find a way to incentivize teachers to attend a workshop in which young people would explain how to implement climate change education within English, math, social studies, and science classrooms using fun virtual climate change resources that this team, in partnership with Catherine Walsh, put together. This climate change in all classrooms workshop, excuse me, has already been created and given to a couple of teachers, and they just need help getting more BPS teachers to take it and use um, the proposed ideas. Um, for the transit team, um, they've been in contact with the MBTA board to advocate putting money from COVID relief into the budget cuts that made the fares, high, um, the fares higher so that people won't have to pay more than they already have been recently. And for the um, on the Green New Deal team, the policy relating to the Massachusetts Renews and Environmental Justice Bill is being filed in February this month. Um, this team is involved in planning the launch event, which is on February 11th, and continues to educate other young people on how that policy will positively impact our communities. Two members of this team are involved in the social media promotion team. Two other youth will be speaking and one member will be co-hosting the event virtually. On to the next subcommittee, the School Climate, Culture and Improvement Subcommittee. Again, for those of you who may not know, the overview of this subcommittee is improving school climate culture, positively impacting instruction, improving school relationships and overall school improvement. We held our first restorative justice circle with several Boston school police officers and a number of students from the SCCI, that's an abbreviation for this subcommittee. In the process of planning a second, where we're currently in the process of planning a second restorative justice circle for the month of February, as the first one went very well. The students appreciated having a space to feel heard and the opportunity to build trust with the school resource officers. The first session was primarily focused on relationship building and getting to know one another. And we are excited to have more difficult conversations on important issues surrounding school policing at future sessions. Uh, we also prepared to, um, we prepared a training to educate BSAC on the progress of a Fund Our Future campaign um, to think about how we can best engage with and support efforts to secure the full funding of the Student Opportunity Act. And we also onboarded a student for participation on the Library Services Strategic Planning Committee. And to our last subcommittee, the Student Rights and Student Voice, also referred to as SRSV. Um, this, the overview of this subcommittee is building opportunities and increasing student voice in decision making. Um, on January 28th, BSAC and Youth on Board hosted a town hall in, collabor in collaboration with the Boston Education Justice Alliance, also known as BEJA. 200 people registered for the town hall. At its peak, we had 153 participants that included students, parents, teachers, and community members. The town hall also had ASL in Spanish interpretation. The town hall was centered around five categories pertaining to school safety, mental health, school reopening, safety concerns and recommendations, virtual learning, experiences and best practices, access to technology, and school discipline. Our panel featured Mr. Cecile Carey from Charlestown High, 
Joshua Quincy Sr. Um, Joshua, uh, um, uh, Joshua Quincy a Sr. and BSAC Vice President Anna Zhao and Beja member and BPS parent Juana Valdez. Um, this subcommittee will begin to prepare for a city council hearing on BSAC's policy agenda, which will include student votes on the school committee. At this hearing, we will present our projects as BSAC and discuss the home rule petition that city council plans to file this month. It is important that the public know who we are and all the amazing work that we do so we can gain support for the petition. Uh, and this subcommittee went through a, um, a train the trainer to learn how to give the student rights um, training to our partners in the future. Students should know their rights and they should be trained by other peers because the code of conduct affects us all students. And I'll take this brief pause, um, as I always do, to mention my personal um, my personal stake and importance of receiving a um, and receiving a vote, because again, it's not just about me, it's about the student representative who sits on this committee, period. I've, I let it be known at the very beginning of my term that my legacy, if anything, would be the last student representative not to have a vote. I believe that it's 2021 and it's simply long overdue. Um, in terms of the mayoral race, BSAC students care very much who the next mayor of Boston will be. In previous election years, BSAC hosted ice cream socials to meet the candidates and share their priorities. Um, and we hope to use a similar strategy this year in the virtual world, keeping in mind, you know, social distancing guidelines. So we, you know, probably will meet in the park instead um, and find a really safe way to do that. Um, BSAC is currently finalizing a list of priorities that BSAC members would want in the next Boston mayor in order to move our projects along. And lastly, um, as I mentioned at my last student report, I am hosting a bi-weekly education conversation town hall every other Monday in partnership with city councilor Julia Mejia's office. And our last one was um, Monday, January 25th. Um, we had our second town hall. Um, in collaboration with her office, and we're simply working to build the infrastructure to regularly create authentic space where community members from all over can engage in transparent, honest conversations while exploring solutions. And many of us actually um, met this past Monday, February 1st, to create a detailed list of demands that will be read to, um, that will be given to either members of um, this committee um, or either shared publicly at some point in the next several weeks. Um, our next meeting is Monday, February 8th, and we look forward to continuing these conversations and mobilizing people to push for structural change. In other words, the work is ever ongoing and expanding. And that concludes my report. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. James. I will now open it up for anybody who has questions. Any members? Yeah. Uh, Vice Chair O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. James. Um, appreciate your report. And uh, one, um, looking forward to you and I are co-hosting the uh, school committee listening session next week that is student Senate. So that is next Tuesday afternoon. And I know BSAC is getting the word out about it. And in thinking through your comments about the high schools and thank you for addressing that. I could see how that really becomes a topic of conversations. We talk about that fifth goal, right? About how to help get our students ready for career. It'll be interesting to hear the feedback about grades, et cetera, about homework in the context of do they feel it's, it's getting them ready. So I'm looking forward to that conversation and, and looking forward to co-hosting it with you. Um, second is, uh, I was really impressed when I heard about the different subcommittees that BSAC has working. You folks have really done a, an excellent job of thinking through all the different ways that student, um, student life is impacted and how you can have a voice in all of those. So thank you for sharing. That's a, that's a big change I've seen. And, and it leads me, of course, to the usual question that we ask occasionally is, and I'm particularly interested now as we've switched to remote, about membership in BSAC from all of our high schools, because it's so important to have all of our high schools, and in particular, our alternative high schools that have sometimes have struggled 
with having um, BSA, a commitment to BSAC representation. So how are you doing on that? How, how, tell us a little bit right now about how BSAC is in age of remote. Yeah, so um, not gonna lie, I think that when we, I think that BSAC can't hammered out a lot of its issues with the remote world when the pandemic first hit last year in the spring. I think between March and um, going into the summertime, it was very much a transitioning period where, you know, like, it, you, you know, when we break off into our subcommittees, it's not the same feel, you know, being able to physically, um, you know, sort of converse with someone and pass papers and, you know, what we're used to doing in the bowling building, which is our regular meeting space. Right. So I think last year in the first several months of the pandemic is when we really experienced our transitioning period. But I think that this, this ever since this school year began, this session of BSAC in um, September, I think that we've actually been doing really good. Um, we've been organizing our times very well. We've been, um, we're already well into, I believe, March when it comes to um, the people who are coming to visit us. Um, we have our BSAC seniors and officers who out, who are um, really reaching out to BSAC representatives and asking, how do you want to structure this time? What do you think is the best way to structure the time? What's more effective? What's least effective? Um, and I think that, you know, we've also added in, the superintendent knows we've added in some really cool features like soundboards where, you know, we'll, we'll play music at the very beginning like we would used to um, back in the bowling building. And we'll have sort of um, little like, you know, claps from the soundboard uh, and little background noises to really just spice things up. So it, you know, whenever I go to BSAC meetings, I know many other BSAC members feel the same. It really feels like a place to unwind, but also get work done. I often go there in, you know, with my pajamas and my robe and probably like my bonnet. I'm like, all right, then let's get to work. Like, come on, guys, let's let's get to work. And sort of that familial um, working space is really hard to come upon. So I think that we've done a beautiful job sort of, um, you know, alleviating those um, stresses and those challenges of the um, virtual world. And um, to the matter of BSAC membership, we do have full membership. I would say that um, time commitments sometimes do um, prevent certain members um, from coming to BSAC meetings. And that's something that um, BSAC um, officers, um, you know, the president, the vice president, and staff are collectively trying to work on. So whether that means, you know, only being able to come to subcommittee time, which happens on Thursdays, or whether it be, you know, someone taking notes and debriefing them or whatever the case may be. So I think that, you know, if, if you would like a, um, a more detailed report of, um, you know, how many students are in BSAC and how many students from each school in, um, in BPS are um, on BSAC, I'd be glad to get that to you by my next student report. Well, uh, no, just mainly if you don't have schools represented and only because we have tended to use the school committee as a chance to help highlight if you've had trouble getting participation in schools. As you know, sometimes a lot of folks are watching this and, and school leader may hear, oh, wow, I didn't realize I didn't have an active rep and glad to get on it type thing. So we just try to help you you know, when you represent every single one of the schools, that's a, that's a pretty powerful bully pulpit, so to speak, as they say. So if you're comfortable that you're having coverage from all the schools, then that's fantastic news. I'm glad to hear it. Definitely. Thank you, Mr. James. Thank you, Ms. Rooney. Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. James. Um, I'm always very empowered, personally, as I hear you reporting what students are doing. Um, I had a question about the subcommittees. Um, are students that are not part of BSAC, but other high school students, are they also part of BSAC subcommittees? No, the, the answer is no. Okay. So um, those are part of BSAC sub. Those are part of BSAC subcommittees are a part of BSAC as a whole. So the, we have um, biweekly meetings, not biweekly meetings. We have meetings twice a week, um, and those fall on Mondays and Thursdays from four to six. And on Mondays, we have um, meetings as an entire body of BSAC. And those um, Mondays usually consist of, um, you know, sort of a debrief of whatever happened at the last meeting, um, you know, major announcements, et cetera, how we want to move forward. 
and then mm -hmm. we have um, um, a special guest come in. So that can be, you know, someone from um, social justice work, someone from another organization, or it's um, a good like 60% of the time, it's someone from the district who comes and gives us a report on anything that a subcommittee is working on. So that's really okay. a chance yeah. for the entire BSAC to sort of understand what other subcommittees are working on and see where everyone's work aligns. Yeah. And then on Thursdays is when we have um, sort of that same structure for but a very small amount of time. And we really use a good amount of our time in our subcommittees to work on our projects, campaigns, and advance our work. Yeah. How big is BSAC's group in, title, in total? Yes, um, I believe it's nearly 50 students. So it's, 50 it's students. Sort of 45 and 50 students. Okay, so that's, that's great that you've got a, a good, strong working group of committed kids to these issues. Um, you know, I, I've heard you say over and over again about the kind of work that students are receiving, um, you know, that some of it appears to be busy work. Yes. And, you know, and clearly as I listen to the subcommittees that you all have, creative for yourselves, the commitment to doing serious work is something that as a district, we really need to be looking at because I would agree with you wholeheartedly that any work students are being asked to do should really be serious and have meaning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was in high school and, and it was a drill and kill, and I used to say one of the things I got out of high school was I became a great Jeopardy player. I knew a lot of tidbits of facts because that was the kind of education that they were promoting. You just the facts, know the facts. I'm really glad that you all want real meaning to the work and to make real contributions so that what you were learning, you were really able to put into action. So my hat goes off to you in the work that BSAC continues to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. We appreciate that very much. And I will say that, you know, to the point of meaningful and really just compelling and impactful work. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, the, that type of work oftentimes doesn't feel like work. I mentioned in my report that I often do go to BSAC and I have, you know, I'm, I'm usually in my pajamas and, you know, some type of headwear as a lot of BSAC students are. And it, it's very familiar and it's like, you know, like we're, we're glad to see each other and we know that we're going to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty and, and get to the work. And, it, you know, it's really empowering and it's, it's so educational at the same time because there are, you know, many times where we're being briefed on these issues and it's like, oh, wow, like I didn't know that was going on in the city. Um, or in the district. And we're just like, okay, well, you know, boom, let's let's learn about it. Let's do our research and let's sort of create an action plan. So it's it's very empowering work that I, I very much love. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Robinson. <clears throat> I also wanna just commend BSAC. I'm always impressed by the committee work. Um, I think it's really smart. And I know you all adopted that um, some years ago but it's very smart to kind of divide the work. Um, and I do think, I always say the environmental piece to me is just you know, something that I'm very passionate about. So I love that you have continued and now you're part of the larger coalition, um, which I think, I can't remember what it's called, so, but um, I know you all are part of that um, larger with adults as well as other youth organizations. So that's um, really great. Uh, and I'm glad that you have taken up um, the MBTA pieces um, and the mayor piece will be important as well. And I also just wanna say thank you um, to all the students who also serve on task forces. So they're not just um, going to the BSAC meetings, but they're also on task forces. And um, this year we um, have adopted to make sure to have two students on every task force where previously we only had one. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're obviously um, very happy about that um, to have student voice at the table. So thank you so much um, for that report. And we look forward to uh, your upcoming reports. Thank you so much. As we move into public comment this evening, I just want to remind everybody about our new practice. And that is we are asking speakers to identify the neighborhood where they reside. We are committed to hearing all the voices and we just want to ensure that all parts of the city are included. And just to note that this is a common practice among other city departments during their public meetings. 
And now we are going to move on to general public comment. And I will ask Ms. Sullivan to take that over. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. We have 30 speakers this evening. So in accordance with school committee policy, time will be reduced to two minutes per person. And I remind you, we have 30 seconds remaining. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. To the attendees who are listening to simultaneous interpretation on a different Zoom channel, please move over to the English language channel when the public testimony is being translated from a non-English language. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you're from before you begin. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also, please make sure that you're signed into Zoom with the same name that you use to sign up for public comments. That will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. We'll begin this evening with um, our school leader, John Travis, and he will introduce our youngest students, Willow Nordsey and Fiona Jewell, who will be uh, co-reading a letter. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the Boston School Committee. Um, last Wednesday, I was here to discuss one of the policy flexibilities that BPS was requesting for the coming school year related to the AWC program. Within my school, I am. My name is John Travis. I'm the principal of the Orenberger School in West Roxbury, um, and a resident of Hyde Park. Um, since uh, my presentation last week, our school community has been in conversations around how we can turn this challenge into opportunity and better ensure excellence and equity for students. On Friday, I received a beautifully written and persuasive letter from two of our current fourth grade students in our AWC program, with recommendations for BPS and for my school, the Beethoven Orenberger K-8. Today, I'm simply here to introduce Fiona and Willow and to say that there may be no greater argument for more students gaining access to the rigorous and excellent curriculum of AWC than hearing from students who use those academic skills that they are honing in class to have an immediate impact in the world around them. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor to Willow and to Fiona. Thank you, welcome Willow. Hi, um, we Fiona Jewell and Willow Norzai as students in the AWC program feel that AWC is an amazing program for Boston Public Schools and should not be removed. The first thing is that AWC is an amazing opportunity to have an advanced education. It is great because it supports students and if there are students that are ahead of their grade level or feel that they are not getting challenged in school, they can get into AWC where there is an advanced curriculum that ensures kids are getting the education they need. Another idea is that some people are saying that they should remove AWC because why should only certain people get a better education? We can say that that is a good point, but why get rid of it when you could expand it? If more schools and classrooms had the AWC curriculum, then anyone could get into AWC with, without having to take a test. Everyone deserves to learn at a level that they feel comfortable with. There are also people saying that the students that are getting into AWC are only white and the test is hurtful to people of color. That is another reason to expand AWC. You would not have to worry about who passes the test and who doesn't because anyone could get into AWC if they wanted. Another point a lot of people are bringing up is that the third graders cannot take the Terra Nova test that you would take to get into AWC. We do not know much about taking tests and whether or not you can take them right now. But what we do know is that that is another reason to expand AWC. 
any amount of people could get into AWC if there are more classes. More classes would mean that anyone could join without having to take a test. Also, someone could say this against AWC. Well, sure, you could expand it, but that costs money. The thing is, it wouldn't because all you have to do is add the AWC curriculum to more schools and classrooms. Another thing we would like to say is that to go to a private school where there are fewer students, which means you get more help, you have to pay. But when you're in AWC, it is free. So that, so for people that want to be in a high learners class but do not have the money, AWC is perfect. The last thing that we would have to say is that the way people get into AWC should change too. If anyone wants to get into AWC, they can get into AWC. This would work because if it were expanded, any amount of people could get in. All in all, we think that it, instead of getting rid of AWC, that it should be expanded and the way of getting into AWC should change. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank Good you. Job. Good job, students. Um, we'll continue hearing from our students with Sama Mari. Monique Thomas Vick, Janat Hassan, and Robin Gomez. If you could please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Sama? I'm not seeing Sama with us. Is Monique Thomas Vick with us? Hello. Hello. Good evening. Sorry. Can you? Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sama Madari. I'm with the organization Roxbury Environmental Empowerment Project, also known as RE. I'm from the city of Boston, and today I'll be sharing a piece called "Into the Mind of a Black Student." Y'all talk about black don't crack yet. I see my people being shattered. And it's only clear to see that this system is all that matters. We're set out at a young age, living in the same governmental place, thinking about drugs, gangs, money to maintain. So we enter high school, more drugs there too. You start being manipulated about the things you got to do. Staying up late, getting high, but that's no use. Pops left when you were eight, so now you can't think straight. College ain't no use since money is cut too short. Instead, you want to ball, get that scholarship, and then move out. Rapping is an option, too, since that's all the muse to block out your struggle and get you loose. This poem re represents the typical mind of a Black student. And as a Black student, I believe we should hire more counselors and less cops. Schools should help a student with the way they respond to a, situa a situation rather than punish them. With the environment most Black students come from, they already deal with a great load of stress. Rather than punishing the student for the way they express themselves, we should hire Black teachers to help the student deal with the situations and how to react to them next time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank our you. Next, our next speaker is Monique Thomas Vick. Okay, sorry, I'm not seeing Monique. Uh, Janat Hassan is our next speaker. She'll be followed by Robin Gomez. Hello? Robin Gomez? Okay, um, our next speaker is Anji Igaro, followed by Aiden Dolores and Simon Chernow. If you can please raise your hands virtually. Johnny?
Hello, my name is Ajene and I'm a BLA student in Dorchester. When it comes to student outreach, the district along with the school committee has completely failed to fully represent its constituents and provide the long denied space needed to voice their concerns and expectations. From lies to excuses, you all have played directly into the system that excludes non-whites from not just having a voice, but an impact at the table. Yet for some reason, you refuse to directly acknowledge and confront it as it would more than likely compromise your political allegiances. Shame on those of you who don't even pretend to hide it. You are all too comfortable with neglecting the duties that you swore to uphold. As a student that has been in this anti-Black, anti-Latina racist system of BPS for about 13 years, I would know. The fact that I had no knowledge of BSAC and other student bodies that were intended to represent me until this school year is a shame. It has become clear to me that the district purposefully makes this information inaccessible to us to keep us in a state of ignorance that allows you all to come and go from these meetings without much pushback from what I would say is the most important group of all, the students of BPS. Are we not the same kids that you call your future? The ones that will be feed that will the ones that will be taking care of you and feeding you medicine and retirement homes when you become elderly and qualify for social security? You'll be lucky if we do not want vengeance after the traumatic experiences that you have put us through. I say this as someone you serve and work for. Start reaching out and listening to our students so that we can all come together and dismantle these systems of oppression of oppression. They are harmful, ineffective, and severely out of date. This is not a request, but a demand. With that being said, the fact that it is 2021 and a student representative does not have a vote is beyond me. Moving forward, the school committee needs to start making visible efforts to incorporate the opinions and needs of young people. We do not just wanna be heard. We want what we have to say to be applied. Come to our schools, come to our classrooms, keep us informed, ask us what we think and take the time to gain from our perspective, then implement it into your policy. And most importantly, exercise the powers given to you and push for the student representative to have a vote. Stop making excuses and do it yesterday. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robin Gomez, who uh, appears to be with us now. Robin? Um, yes. Um, hi, my name is Robin. I attend Boston Arts Academy, and I'm a sophomore. Um, I currently reside in Dorchester. I'm here to express my concerns for the school community, the school committee. Um, I feel as if the school committee should engage us students in the district's work. Um, we should, we have firsthand experience in what changes the district makes and the rules are in place. I personally feel like the district wouldn't be a district without us students and we should be able to advocate for our school community. We are a team, so we should be able to speak and move as one, regardless of age. And I will also love to act, actively push our student rep and I would love to give Kimani a vote. It's pretty self-explanatory about how much work he has put in and has yet to receive what he deserves. And that's it for today. Thank, Thank you. you, Robin. Next, we'll hear from Adan Dolores, followed by Simon Chernow, Katie Malcolmus, and Maya Blanco. Adan? I'm not seeing it done. Let's try Simon Chernow. Hello, everyone. Are y'all can hear me? Yes. All right, cool. Um, hello. Hello, everyone. I'm back again. My name is Simon Chernow. I live in Jamaica Plain, and I'm a senior at Boston Land Academy. I'm also a member of BSAC, but I want to make clear that this statement I'm about to read is my own personal opinion and does not reflect the opinions of BSAC members. I'm here to today to talk again about the necessity for a student vote on the school committee. As most of us know, there's only one student on this committee and they're the only member that cannot vote and does not receive a stipend. To put this into simple terms, this is adultism, plain and simple. It is illogical that the only member that actually lives with the benefits and consequences of these decisions has zero say in their outcome. The student rep can disagree with others, provide a student perspective and add value to discussions, but when it is time to turn these conversations into tangible policies, they are left voiceless. This is immoral and quite frankly can be connected to why so many students have such low confidence in the district. Why would a student in BPS feel obligated to trust the same district that doesn't seem to reciprocate that trust in their school committee meetings? I'm gonna repeat that again, like I did last week. Why would a student in BPS feel obligated to trust the same district that does not seem to reciprocate that trust in school committee meetings. 
Now, I'm not blaming anyone on the school committee or in BPS for a policy that they had no control over, but I am calling on all of you to speak to support student voice. I'm asking again, since I did this last time, but I haven't seen anything that every member use their voice and publicly through social media speak out in support for giving a student a vote on the school committee. As members of this body, although you cannot change our current situation, you have a lot of power in your voices. So I hope that you follow through with my ask. Thank you again for my time. And I am plan to keep coming back as long as I'm a student and as long as I'm in Boston until the student has a vote because it's illogical, like everyone continues to say. So thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Katie Malcolmus. Good evening, school committee. My name is Katie Malcolmus and I'm a senior at Boston Arts Academy and a very proud Dorchester resident. I want to thank you all for providing the space for public comment once again, as I can say, it's definitely one of my favorite parts of the night. I come tonight to ask you all to include our students, parents, and families more in the decisions you all make. We are making some great strides in our district that I am very proud of, such as the listening sessions coming up. And yet I would like to see our students, parents, and families be more included in our district conversations and to not just be allowed to be present for them. I have watched as Mr. James continuously enacts in community outreach and engagement. And I would love to see the entirety of our district seek in community input just as much. Thank you all for your efforts. And thank you, Mr. James, for always being the example of what our district is progressing towards. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Maya Blanco. She'll be followed by Dejanae Gale. Maya? Maya, are you with us? Okay, Dejanae Gale. Hi, my name is Dejanae. I am a resident of High Park and I'm from the organization REAP, also known as Roxbury Environmental Empowerment Project. I believe as a black student that we should hire more black teachers because it allows students to have a closer connection and a better interaction with school and education. Having more black teachers will impact the graduation and educational interest in some students that might not really know what they want to do in the future. Having these teachers in classrooms can allow them to feel more comfortable and have a better understanding in learning the things they love. Sometimes they just need that extra push for someone who experienced the same thing that they have been through to allow them to feel like someone is there for them. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tanakiba Campbell, followed by Charlie Adams. And please raise your hand virtually. Sinekiba, and I'm from the Roxbury Empowerment Project, which is also known as RIP. I believe that having more counselors in schools will improve safety and create a safe space so that Black students could share their feelings if they don't feel comfortable sharing it to other people. Yes, cops should text us and do their jobs, but some Black students may be traumatized or scared of cops because some cops carry loaded guns, which could be very, very scary for some students. Having a counselor in school can make a major change, allowing them to be disciplined themselves and teach them how to deal with conflicts if they ever come, ever come, up, ever come upon them. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Charlie Adams, followed by Ariana Jade Adwara and Jada St. Louis.
Charlie, you with us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Hello again, it's Charlie, a BPS student in Southie. You know, I feel like I need to be earning a paycheck weekly for being a BPS student because I'm literally working an office job, just doing work, 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 work. I had to work through the death of my family member, through breakdowns, through the pandemic, because if I don't, I will fail. I am not the only student who experiences this. Now imagine how I felt when I learned that schools like mine are using their autonomy and audacity to make snow days more school days. We all know BLA loves circumventing around the district's policies to ensure students are working 25-8 with absolutely no, and I mean no compensation in hand. BLA needs to keep our snow days and not transform them into regular school days. These snow days grant us the time to finally breathe and acknowledge our state of being. To those of you who see schools like BLA do this and you're just sitting there on your phones, your silence is complicitness and I'm hearing it loud and clear. Us students can literally never win. Vacations mean nothing to most students because so many are assigned work over break by their own teachers. Students lives are Google Classroom, 62 tabs open on their laptops, probably have skipped breakfast and lunch. They literally have no more desk space. Their backs hunch so bad to the point where you got students feeling 32 years old. A prime example is Mr. James, who's getting no sleep and is here right now with you all. After this call, I promise you, we will be in a virtual study group and studying until probably 5 a.m. in the morning once again. The way he is able to be so progressive and proactive in this work while being oppressed by the same body he works with is admirable, all while getting no paycheck and no vote. I'm giving you a round of applause, Mr. James. My heart sinks for the students who will still be in BPS after I graduate. The trauma and helplessness that they're feeling is something I never want any child to ever experience in their lifetime. No wonder why enrollment is decreasing in BPS. The system for students isn't even working. In fact, it's almost killing us, or at least me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ariana Jade Adwara. Ariana, not seeing her. Okay, Jada St. Louis. Hi, my name is Jada St. Louis, and I'm a student of Boston Arts Academy and a Dorchester resident. I want to thank you all for allowing this space for public comment, but I am here tonight to encourage the school committee to engage our students more in the district's work. As students, we experience the entirety of the district firsthand, so no one can speak better on what needs to be changed and what could be possible solutions than us. If there were no students, there would be no district. So please join your students, Mr. James, in the work of many organizations at getting us, the students, at the forefront of the changes that affect us the most. One of the action steps you all could take is to actively push for our student rep, Mr. James, and the reps to follow and receive, and receive a vote, whether it's publicizing your support via social media or making a statement. We would love to see you all supporting the movement. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jess Madden Fuoco. She'll be followed by Mike Heishman, Ruby Reyes, Roxy Harvey, and Edith Bazile. If you could all please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Jess? Hi, thank you so much. My name is Jess Madden Fuoco. I'm a Hyde Park resident, a BPS parent of two children at the Hernandez K-8 school an instructional transformation coach at the English High School. I came to speak with you last year in February during Black Lives Matter Week of Action in School. I told you about my former student, Jonan Guerrero, who was murdered one year ago. I told you about how we used restorative practices at both the Hernandez and at Margarita Muniz Academy to support students and staff with this tremendous loss. In 2020, some people's eyes were open to issues of racial injustice. We have heard calls to defund the police and some people worry about that and they worry about removing police from schools. The Boston Public Schools currently spends approximately $4 million per year on school police. And by my calculations, we only spend approximately $300,000 on restorative justice. This means that we spend 13 times more money on school police than we do on restorative justice. As a parent and an employee, that breaks my heart. In case you are someone who is worried about defunding the police and funding restorative justice instead, I want to bring you into what this could look like. Right now, we have school police who respond or react when bad things happen, 
But what if instead we had restorative justice practitioners in schools who were engaged in work that prevented bad things from happening? Many of my favorite school police officers might even apply for one of these jobs. I am here again this year to ask you, as I did last year, for additional funding to support restorative justice. It is unacceptable that we spend 13 times more money on school police than we do on restorative justice practices. We need to look to make substantive changes to how we are in relationships with one another in the Boston public schools, not just changes to what school police officers wear. By funding restorative justice practices, we can end the school to prison and the school to deportation pipelines, and we can show that Black lives matter to us in the Boston public schools. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Our next speaker is Mike Heishman. Hello, Mike Heishman, Dorchester, member of Beja, Boston Education Justice Alliance. Uh, my prepared my remarks, my first couple of sentences, I'm a retired history teacher and I have a concern about February being Black History Month. Every month of the year must be Black History Month. So it was a pleasure earlier in the meeting to hear the comments of uh, uh, Chair Davilia De and Dr. Caselius. Thank you, thank you. It's good to be on the same page. A positive development this year has been the move towards ethnic studies. This program deserves much more support from the superintendent. I want to very quickly say how much I've been inspired by the student voices that I heard earlier today, and I fully agree that uh, the students need to have a, uh, not only a voice, but they need to have a vote. At the last school committee meeting on January 27th, I was pleased with the school committee's pushback against the advanced working class AWC program, which disproportionately benefits white and Asian students. Two days later, I attended a Boston School Department equity meeting. The meeting was a discussion of the AWC and Excellence for All, EFA, a program in some schools for grades three to six. The information about EFA was inspiring. This program strives to provide a quality, equitable, and relevant education for all of the children. I don't see a need for the school department to establish an AWC committee. You are always saying that you view all policies through an equity and anti-racism lens. We need a proposal from Dr. Cecilius to rapidly end AWC and transition to EFA for all of our children. EFA, excellence for all, should be our new mantra for the entire system. The superintendent school committee do whatever it can do to mitigate the damage done to our children because of the coronavirus. MCAS and MCAS test preparation are always inequitable and racist. I have asked many times that you pass a resolution calling for the suspension of MCAS this year. Uh, I will send the rest of my comments into the school committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Heishman. Our next speakers are Ruby Reyes, Roxy Harvey, and Edith Bazil. And in honor of Black History Month, the chair will honor the request of our next group of speakers to deliver their testimony in its entirety. So I'll set the clock at three minutes. Ms. Reyes. Hello, my name is Ruby Reyes and I'm the director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance and Dorchester resident. Each year you present a budget based on what we have been given by the mayor rather than what our school communities actually need and preparing a budget proposal that provides a quality education for each student. The city charter gives you clear authority to change anything in the superintendent's budget, including adding money. As we've prepared for the presentation of the BPS budget, we cannot help but add remind to your guiding principles of return, recover, and reimagine. Beja wants to remind you that we have asked for a budget proposal that captures the needs of all of our students, even those being disproportionately left out, like our Black and Brown students. As we begin Black History Month, Beja wants you to recommit to addressing equity across the district, not just in your words, but in your actions, and not just for those with the most privilege, like exam school students, but those who are being the most systematically disenfranchised, like Black and Latino high-need students and families, 
who have had to fight for services even before the pandemic. Reinventing facts by saying that small schools are predominantly white, as Nate Cooter said at the school committee retreat, is an effort to push for school closures and it is not recovering, returning, or reimagining what our school communities need. We don't need more scare tactics or continuing to feed a culture of pitting schools and families against one another. On average, small schools are mostly black and Latino, especially in the high schools. Statistics that are available to everyone on the DESE website. Reimagine Googling that. The excruciating history of closing schools and BPS has meant targeting black and Latino students who are falsely labeled as underperforming or closed under suspicious circumstances. For example, West Roxbury Educational Complex was closed by former city inspector, Buddy Christopher, who is under investigation for bribery allegations. And the closed quote unquote school was later used by the Boston Police Department. Reevaluate your central office staff so that you have people who are qualified and want to support schools to succeed rather than presenting inaccurate information to push for school closures. Create a budget proposal where there are no losers and you are not underperforming. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roxy Harvey. Ms. Harvey. Thank you, sorry. My name is Roxy Harvey. I'm the chair of SPEDPAC and a resident of Dorchester. Special education is services, accommodations, and modifications that need to be planned for in advance, provided and integrated throughout every aspect of BPS for our students to be able to get to access to the general education curriculum and be fully included in all BPS programming. As such, it was refreshing to hear at the Equity Roundtable that some school leaders are implementing measures for excellence for all and not a separate elitist program that leaves students that aren't selected feeling unworthy or unable to access future success. Special edu education students, similar to all other students, need to know that they can be successful regardless of what school they are assigned to. And that is why it's important to have special education represented in all working groups throughout BPS because special education is a part of every aspect of BPS. Representation is important at all times of the year. It is especially important in the communities that have not been traditionally represented, such as black and brown communities, special education communities, and English learner communities, which sometimes black students fit into all of those categories. It is imper imperative that black history, which is American history, be highlighted beyond February. That is the only way we'll be able to see things such as nine-year-old little black girls being pepper sprayed and arrested or 16-year-old black girls being body slammed in schools. We need to make sure that we recognize that these children are children and need to be treated with value and respect. In order to close the achievement gap and strive for equity among students and true excellence for all beyond a slogan, we need to show that we value all cultures, languages, and neurodiverse communities that our families represent. Data clearly shows that Boston has black students overrepresented in sub-separate classrooms without inclusion opportunities and white and Asian students overrepresented in advanced work classes and exam schools. This is not because of the fallacy um, that black students aren't as smart, don't work as hard, or families don't value education as much as white or Asian students, as some families that come in front of school committee have stated, versus the lack of support black and special education students are not being provided at these schools. It is because of the systemic racism in our district that will continue if we don't have a specific plan for hiring black teachers and school leaders, providing a challenging curriculum for all students, equitable, equitable distribution of resources, training and implementation of a course load that can provide excellence for all. It is not enough to just say it. Our students need schools that are trauma informed, culturally sensitive, willing to service all students and prepared to provide interventions mm -hmm. and able to provide equitable allocation of needed resources and services. We, more, we need more than COVID-19 compensatory services. We need compensatory services and resources across schools that allow excellence for all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Edith Bazil and she'll be followed by Carla Mendoza, Erica Kuka and Nicole Riley. If you can please raise your hands. Thank you so much. My name is Edith Bazil. Georgetown Law Center recently published a report which concluded, quote, 
Adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like, especially in the age range of five to 14, end of quote. Why is this important? Because it explains what happened to a nine-year-old black girl three days ago when multiple police officers dragged her across the snow, held her down, handcuffed her, then pepper sprayed her while she begged for her father. The arresting officer shouted, stop acting like a child. Her response was, I am a child. So how does this relate to historical oppression? Professor Dumas's research states, quote, beginning in slavery, black boys and girls were often put to work as young as two and three years old. Black children were rarely perceived as being worthy of playtime and were severely punished for exhibiting normal childlike behavior, end of quote. The Justice Policy Institute concludes, police do not make schools safer. In fact, it has negative consequences and creates trauma for black students. The economic foundation of this country was built on the forced labor of black people. Despite this atrocity, black people were major contributors of inventions and innovations across all fields and professions with, which dramatically reshaped American life. Every man, woman, and child in this country benefits from the history of black labor and inventions. And it is time to acknowledge that black history is not the flavor of the month or a series of events, movies, or slideshows. Black history is American history. And for black lives to matter, black history must be taught through pre-K through 12 in every content area. But the rigorous works of black scholars are not represented in teaching content because BPS eliminated its hardworking, highly qualified black bilingual bicultural co-creator of ethnic studies, Natasha Scott, who, and did not give her credit, then watered down the ethnic studies curriculum. Black students do not read about their ancestors' innovations and triumphs in the literacy curriculum because BPS eliminated its highly qualified black bilingual bicultural ELA director, Dr. Oneida Fox Roy, while applauding her work. We need to say their name. Black leaders are not empowered. Black educators are pushed out and black history is not taught due to the culture of anti-black racism and BPS and our students suffer as a result. Black students do not have equitable access to high performing schools, advanced work classes or exam schools. Instead, black students attend under-resourced, understaffed, underfunded and underperforming schools with crumbling infrastructures, higher school closing, harsher disciplinary treatment and more frequent contact with police. Special education is weaponized to deny equity to black students by withholding critical instructional interventions and focusing on behavior only. It is a process where black students are not served but sentenced to segregated settings, often leading to DYS commitment, which fuels a special education to prison pipeline. The district has a moral, ethical, and legal obligation to change this and create an infrastructure with a district strategy led by highly qualified, competent black leadership who are well equipped to implement culturally responsive guardrails to improve academic outcomes and excellence for all students. In closing, thank you. As the student progress, as the district progresses towards getting students back to school, it can begin by removing school police and using those funds to provide aspirational, evidence-based, decolonized curriculum in classrooms with embedded social emotional support, hiring more black educators as the student stated, providing high quality job embedded professional development, ongoing coaching, and ensuring that the broken special ed system is fully transformed and aligned with evidence-based supports, resources, and services that provide access to the curriculum and college and career readiness. Thank you so much. And I hope next time we have Haitian and Cape Verdean Creole interpreters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speakers are Carla Mendoza, Erica Kuka, Nicole Riley, and Betsy Bowman. If you can please raise your hands virtually. Carla? Good evening, everyone. My name is Carla. I reside in East Boston. I am a former student of BPS. I attended a number of schools in the district and am now an educator at the East Boston EEC. I remember vivid encounters with school police and just police in general. When I was just six years old, a white police officer pulled my father over and immediately took out his gun when my father was going to step out of his car. To this day, there wasn't a reason other than maybe my father being Latino. Ever since that day, I tried to avoid police officers at all costs. 
In my neighborhood, police officers did more damage than good, and it rolled over into my school experience with school police. Seeing people that look like him, dressed like him, had the same demeanor as him, triggered that little six-year-old girl's experience inside me every time. To say the least, it made me uncomfortable, and I was always on my toes around them. They acted accordingly to law enforcement, which has a representation of mishaps involving my people. Unfortunately, I cannot get into the countless negative things I've seen throughout the years involving police officers and school police, but something that doesn't make sense to me is how did I see more of them than I did of my guidance counselors? How was my guidance counselor able to write me a letter of recommendation to college when I had no idea who the woman was? Myself and many of my peers were troubled children, but we didn't need police officers to arrest us, to jeopardize our futures, or to tell us where we'll end up if we keep at this pace. We needed guidance. School is a space designed for learning and we needed direct help and personal engagement rather than protection from ourselves. And it's not enough to change a uniform if people wearing them remain the same. Young people in BPS need guidance counselors, mental health support, restorative justice practices, and curriculums that aim to dig deeper than the surface, focus on their futures, overall well-being and safety over school police. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Erica Kuka. Hi, my name is Erica Kuka. I live in Jamaica Plain and I teach in Dorchester. Um, as usual, I am in awe of all the people who spoke before me. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I wanna just reiterate some of the comments that I heard earlier tonight, specifically around funding um, for mental and behavioral health services, as well as for restorative justice. I had the pleasure of meeting and collaborating with Betsy Bowman for the first time this week. Um, Betsy, I learned is one of the four, or was one of the four restorative justice coordinators that the Restorative Justice Organizing Committee had advocated for and won for the district. And this year, Betsy's position, um, or next year, Betsy's position will no longer exist, meaning that we now have only three restorative justice coaches or three people who have that, um, that phrase in their title. And so I'm, I guess I'm curious, not that I know this question is gonna get answered, but I'm curious and I wanna bring this to the attention of more people, like how the district is, as um, Ruby Ray said, like really, um, putting their talk into action when we talk about equity, when we talk about racial justice, um, how are we really allowing schools and students and you know anyone in the district to have a leg to stand on um, with regard to those issues when we're really not um, funding the types of services that students need and funding the types of professionals who can help us get those services and, and help ensure that schools are a safe and welcoming um, and healthy place for students um, and who can help us move forward out of a space where we really need to rely on having police in schools and more into a space where we can just rely on each other to keep one another safe. Um, so that's all I came to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speakers are Nicole Riley, Betsy Bowman, Sharon Hinton, Janelle Fenton, and Kim Bissett. If you can please raise your hand virtually. Is Nicole with us? Nicole Riley? Okay, I'm not seeing Nicole. Betsy Bowman? Hi, everybody. My name is Betsy uh, Bowman. I'm the Restorative Practices Coordinator at the Dearborn, and I live in Somerville. Uh, and I want to speak tonight to echo a lot of what Erica just said and what Jess said earlier um, and many others to really challenge and ask the committee in the district to make a more clear and substantial commitment to the implementation of restorative justice values throughout our district. I hear us use the phrase restorative justice a lot and I think in theory we believe in it. Um, we want to build relationships in community. We want to respond to conflict and harm in ways that are compassionate. 
RGA is on documents and flowcharts and glossy pictures and binders all over the place. But if you were to sample BPS student staff and families, I don't think you would find consensus about what restorative justice means. And while you would hear uh, about beautiful RJ practices happening in many corners of many buildings, you would not find evidence of deep implementation of RJ practices across the district. I wanna challenge us to do better than using restorative justice as a buzzword. It's not a program or a technique or a strategy or a fad. This is a way of being that challenges the dominant culture. It is slow, it is non-hierarchical, it demands deep listening and presence. And as such, I see restorative justice as a fundamental cultural and linguistically sustaining practices because it directly challenges the dominant white supremacy culture. This is complex interdisciplinary work that could transform our schools. But to do all that, we need a clearer plan. We need more tangible human and time resources to make it happen. As Erica explained, four years ago, the BTU negotiated with the district for these four district level positions and I've been privileged to have one of them for the last three years. And I'm happy to hear Dr. Caselius talk about changing the uniforms and the cars and the, and the sort of direction of the school safety officers. But at the end of the day, if we're spending 13 times more on the school safety officers and eliminating a position like mine, um, it just makes me question what, where we're headed. So I'm looking for a clear plan for implementing RJ as a way of being in our schools and for the human and time resources it would take to make it more than just a buzzword in our district. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Hinton. Good evening. My name is Sharon Hinton, but that's not, not all of who I am. I'm a homeowner in Hyde Park, but that doesn't define everywhere I live. I live in a city where a black mother and educator with over 35 years in the school system is recommended twice by the Boston School Committee nominating panel, supported by students, teaching colleagues, and a diverse coalition of community members, and is still rejected by a white male mayor who legally didn't have to interview anyone before making his appointment. Am I playing the race card? No, because I didn't put the card in the deck. A stacked deck where we are told to go to school, get the necessary education, credentials, experience, be qualified, learn the system and play the game only to hear you're overqualified or not the right fit, or we decided to go in a different direction. Play by the rules. The rules have changed though. No one told you that the game was set up. It's just another barrier to keep you out of the game. In the 90s, the Boston School Committee game was changed from elected to appointed. Today in 2021, the schools are just as segregated. The school to prison pipeline is still real. Black and brown students are still being miseducated and denied opportunities and resources, and the system is still as racist and rigged as ever. It's time to change the game and the rules. The Boston School Committee members should be elected, not appointed. Let me say that again. The Boston School Committee members should be elected, not appointed. Why is the only elected school committee member not compensated and has no vote? Are the current school committee members satisfied with that? Do you honestly believe that if every school committee member and city councilor wanted the student rep position changed, things would stay the same? If you think Mr. James or the next BSAC student rep should have a vote and be compensated, then say something, do something. I heard so many people acknowledge Black History Month while I watched too many marginalized and ignore the needs of Black students, Black teachers, and Black people. Silence is complicity. Enough of the dog and pony show and business and politics as usual. We need changes. Stop the smoke and mirrors. Like Malcolm said, don't piss on me and tell me it's raining. Current Boston School Committee members have the privilege of being appointed, but there are voices and votes that are not being heard or counted. It doesn't matter if you're in the field or in the house on the plantation, it's still the plantation. It's time for all of the people in Boston to have their voices and votes counted, elect, not appoint the Boston School Committee now. Thank you. Black Teachers Matter, happy Black History Month. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janelle Fenton and she'll be followed by Kim Bissett. Janelle? Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, hello, I'm Janelle Fenton, and I work with the organization called REAP, which is Roxbury, um, sorry, Roxbury 
Sorry, let me just say read. I attend UMass Boston, and I'm a former student uh, that used to um, go to BPS also. I have noticed the problems in the school system, and which I mean is, is in the history classes. As a Black person, I have observed and learned for many years how um, Black kids and youth um, in the sorry, in the school system is being controlled. And what I mean is being controlled is that we still be learning about slavery and not know other history. We don't learn about other history that started from before slavery as us being kings and queens and we had lands and we had resources and we know how to read and write and do math before. BPS has to do better about that has to do better about it. And I want better for black people and black kids when they grown up. I want them to see their worth and see they're worth something. And I wanted them, I want them to see a picture better than how they try to picture a white person is better and a black person isn't. Thank you. Thank you, Janelle. Our final speaker is Kim Bissett. Hi, my name is Kim Bissett, and I'm a I have a son in the fourth grade at Ornberger and a daughter in K-1 at Beethoven. I'm an active member of both school committee, and I'm on the on uh, I'm an active member of both of the school communities, and I'm on the student council and the uh, the parent council. Sorry, excuse me, the parent council and the site council. I want to first acknowledge the incredible young people who share their thoughts, dreams, and visions of a meaningful and effective and positive educational experience. I am hopeful for our future after hearing them think carefully and deeply about the changes they want to implement. My son is currently in the um, engaging and wonderful AWC program, and we just had a conversation led by Dr. John Travis about what our community wants to see. We heard from everyone from young people to, we heard from young people in the program to, we also heard from, uh, distinguished alumni, very diverse range of people. So I think it's important to keep the AWC because it allows for different people to be represented and go forward. Um, trying to look at the time. Okay. Um, my son was struggling in the third grade, not because the teachers weren't incredible, because his challenges, his need to be challenged wasn't met. And then when he entered the AWC, he's been thriving even during a very challenging pandemic. I think it's very important for Boston Public Schools to have kind of a beacon and able to help them move forward in their educational experiences for all young people. And we've been talking about, I don't think it's right to take it away, but to expand it, to have other students being able to access that program and be able to move forward in their educational um, endeavors. So to really create more opportunities, not less. I don't think it makes sense if we talk about restorative justice and creating community and helping students move forward to take things away, I think it makes sense to expand and look at what the students really need to go forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Oliver Davila, that concludes our speakers for general public comment. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And thank you to all the speakers this evening. I'm always just really, um, touched by everybody that comes out um, and really talks to us. So thank you again. Our only action item this evening is the superintendent's request for flexibilities on the following BPS policies due to COVID for school year 2020-2021, promotion and retention, which includes attendance and assessment requirements, graduation, and advanced work class AWC testing, You'll recall that the superintendent presented this request at our January 27th meeting. And superintendent, I just want to pass it to you if you have any final comments. No, I just appreciate the committee's uh, consideration of these flexibilities in order to um, work on some of our policies so that we can um, uh, forward our student outcomes and, and uh, get the work that we need to do done. Thank you. And I will now open it up to the committee for any final questions or comments. Okay, if there are no further questions, I will entertain a motion to approve as presented.
the superintendent's request for flexibilities on the following BPS policies due to COVID for school year 2020-2021, promotion and retention, graduation, and advanced work class AWC testing. So Is there a motion? So thank moved. you, Dr. Coleman. Is, thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? I'm sure if I may make a quick comment because it's about the motion. Superintendent, I just want to, um, first of all, thank you for the approach you took in regards to AWC, which was laying out a couple of suggested approaches and allowing the school communities to talk it through and, and make a decision there. Um, I, I just think in today's day and age, that's a, a great approach to take. And, and also I wanna echo the comments and I appreciate that you're gonna take a close look at excellence for all. I think in concept, it's an excellent idea. I know you've started to look at it and um, I would love your thoughts over time on um, what is working and what the challenges are and how we can improve it and, and increase it across our entire district so that all of our students have the opportunity for more rigor in our classrooms that are increasingly inclusive so that all of our students in those classrooms have that opportunity. Uh, there's so much good that can come from excellence for all being across, but I know you are at your core an educator and you wanna make sure we do it right. And so I think this is a, a two-step pro, you know, allowing schools to decide in their own about AWC for what works for their communities while we really look to expand this access across our entire district for all of our students. And so I, I just wanted to say, I, I appreciate and support your approach on this. Um, and I would love to see how we push excellence for all across our entire district. That's the goal. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vice Chair. Are there any other uh, comments? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Vice Chair O'Neill. Um, I agree with you, I'm, I'm facilitating, so I'm not, I'm not used to facilitating in this way and I don't get to make as many comments, but I agree with everything you said. Um, so if uh, there is no objection or discussion to the motion, I would um, like to uh, ask Ms. Sullivan to call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Motion is approved unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Um, our first and only report this evening is the superintendent's fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget recommendations. Uh, and before uh, we turn this over to Chief Financial Officer Nay Cooter, and the BPS budget director, Miriam Rubin. I would like to invite the superintendent uh, to give any opening remarks. You're on mute, superintendent. You're on mute, superintendent. Am I, okay, I'm, I'm unmuted now? Yeah. That happens like 500 times a day. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. As I introduce Chief Financial Officer Nate Cooter to provide the committee and the community the overview of the fiscal year 2022 budget for Boston Public Schools, I just wanted to take a moment um, to recognize this moment in history. This budget um, proposal represents our largest ever investment in our schools. And as you'll hear from Chief Cooter, it includes an additional $36 million increase from the city the additional investment is to ensure schools that are seeing declining enrollments do not see um, disparate impacts in their budgets and it provides the needed wraparound services and supports um, for our children, such as um, school liaisons, uh, social workers for every school, among many other investments. And the entire budget is grounded uh, in our principles of returning strong and recovering and then uh, really reimagining our schools. We're proud to present this budget to you tonight. It represents our deeply held belief that every child in our school can and will succeed. Um, that if we invest in their teachers and build a supportive community around them, that they'll not only meet our expectations, they will exceed them. 
And when adults create the conditions in which children succeed, they absolutely do. There's no better time than now to give, you know, given the pandemic, uh, to make these historic investments in our children who have unfairly had to carry this large burden um, and you know, could just impact their entire life success if we don't get it right. So our commitment remains to ensure access to high quality schools in every neighborhood and an equitable learning experience for our students in every grade in every single school. We can accept nothing less for our children. The five-year strategic plan that you unanimously adopted last spring outlines our shared vision for accomplishing this goal and the budget presented tonight represents the resources needed to make progress toward our shared goals. This past Monday tragically marks the one year anniversary of our first confirmed COVID-19 case in Boston. Next month we'll reach the one year mark since we made that difficult decision, um, but necessary decision to close our school buildings. And at that time, you know, we didn't, we thought it would be just a couple of weeks until we, you know, be back. And now uh, many of our students, you know, have been out of school for almost a, a full year, but they're resilient and we're resilient people and we live in a resilient city. And so I want to thank our students, our families, all of our teachers, our school leaders, our secretaries, our nurses, custodians, bus drivers, our school safety officers, our food and nutrition staff, our paraprofessionals, counselors, social workers, psychologists, our central office team, all of our school-based staff, the city, this committee, uh, our many community partners across this city, the mayor and all of his cabinet for all that we've done and all that everyone has done to come together as a city for our students over the past year. It's remarkable to think about all we've been through this year. And although it's been bumpy at times, um, every single person has gone above and beyond to give their best and to make the best out of this very challenging and painful year. Uh, we know that we must return well, but there is a long road of recovery ahead. And so I wanted to just remind you and the public on some of the things that um, we've lived through during this year and some of the ways that we've really stepped up for our children and their families and our whole community. When we closed our doors March 17th, we quickly pivoted to remote learning, printing out tens of thousands of packets over a single weekend so that students started off remote learning with assignments. We had wonderful college partners who helped us. I think it was the Harvard lawyers who helped us with our printing and a few other um, uh, partners who helped us with all of that printing. We had provided 40,000 Chromebooks to students um, to date. We initially had 20,000 so that every student who requested a Chromebook received a Chromebook. We've provided thousands of vouchers and hotspots and other access for home Wi-Fi for our students and forged new partnerships with Comcast uh, in order to do that. We've provided nearly 4 million meals, including more than 1 million delivered to students and families. We began producing fresh meals at more than 20 schools, leading to more than 250,000 of those meals being served so far. And we plan on continuing to expand this fresh uh, quality meals to our, to our families. We secured hundreds of vouchers for students and their families to access housing and uh, through a partnership with the city, actually a thousand um, housing, housing vouchers have been secured. We've seen more than 14,000 connections with more than 3,600 students for behavioral health counseling. We initiated community roundtables to elevate voice, connect with students, families, advocates, and partners, and all of our city residents. We also initiated school-based equity roundtables toward that same outcome to ensure that schools were working with their school-based communities, parents and advocates and partners within the school community. We repaired more than 6,000 windows. We delivered thousands of masks for students and staff and have many thousands more, hundreds of thousands more in, um, in our distribution center ready to go if needed. We secured 7,500 air purifiers. We've upgraded all of our air filters and we'll continue to upgrade and replace those. 
We are advocating for access to the vaccine for our teachers, and we thank our BTU partners in helping us with that, as well as everyone else who's been lifting that up. We have also released a RFP for data loggers where the air quality will give um, uh, on-time uh, air quality measures to our central environmental team. The data dashboard to report on confirmed positive student and staff cases in schools to increase transparency and in reporting. We're monitoring temperatures. We conduct air quality testing and are increasing our air testing methods. We've just conducted walkthroughs with our BTU partners. We issued a request for proposal for start um, within our data loggers. We've also launched a data dashboard that reports on attendance and engagement, which I shared with you earlier. We started free COVID-19 testing for staff and students in 53 schools. And if you remember, we started testing with just one site at Fenway. We've now expanded the um, testing and testing our students in 53 stu uh, schools across the city. And we are in final stages now of planning for a robust vaccine rollout for our BPS community educators and staff. As we look forward to ending out this school year on a strong note, launching a comprehensive approach to summer and begin our planning for our return September of 2021, we outlined our plan this budget to return, recover, and reimagine. Chief Cooter will provide more detail, and I want to get to that report, but what we're announcing tonight represents the next step in our commitment to students, families, and educators, and this is our roadmap. Over the coming weeks, you'll hear more about our comprehensive strategy to realize our promises of our plans so that we better communicate with students and families and engage our overall community. It will take all of us to ensure we're able to return to school for the richness of in-person learning and all of the support services so that we recover any learning loss and the trauma of the pandemic from the years of structural and institutional races, um, race, um, racism. And also um, we reimagine what an authentic case looks like because we're going back to what we were doing before. Thank you for the opportunity to press it. I look forward to the presentation and our ongoing conversation tonight, next week, and over the course of the next several months. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to Chief Cooter. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, good evening, Chairperson. Oliver Davila and members of the school committee. My name is Nathan Cooter, Chief Financial Officer. I'm a resident of Roslindale and a proud parent of two BPS students. Thank you for the opportunity to present the FY22 budget for the Boston Public Schools. Before we dive into our presentation, I wanna introduce an expert in school budgeting, someone who certainly knows more than I do about the meaning behind the numbers we are presenting tonight. Uh, joining us this evening is Nora Vernaza, the head of Tech Boston Academy, uh, six through 12 school in Dorchester and uh, a thoughtful partner with me on the school budget process. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Vernaza. Thanks, um, Nate. And thank you to the school committee for having me and for hearing uh, the school perspective on the impact this budget will have. Um, I would definitely not consider myself uh, an expert in this, but I would consider myself a huge advocate and fighter for the resources that our students need. Um, and for my nine years as a school leader, I have spent eight of them fighting uh, Chief Cooter for every cent I possibly could get for my students um, and for the resources I needed. So I think he called me here tonight because this is the first budget season that I did not spend my Christmas break begging him for cents. Um, in order to increase resources for my students. And not only has my budget this year been a huge relief as a school leader, as we've gone through 18 months um, of, of resource depletion for our students, but it also has allowed me to increase um, supports for special education students, increase social emotional supports in my building, and um, overall ability to 
resource my, my building in a way that I truly can recover and help my students come back in, in a fully capable way next year. So I, I can't say enough about the relief that this budget season had for us at the school level. Um, as we think about next year and plan for next year, instead of thinking about what we can't have, we're thinking about what else we can have um, and what we can do for our students and what more we can do for our students. So thank you all for making that happen. And thank you to Mayor Walsh uh, for the investment he's made in that and for Superintendent Caselius and her leadership on all of that. Thank you for joining us this evening and for kickstarting this budget presentation. Over the last three months, my team and I have worked with 123 schools and Ms. Vernaza is one of the many, many school leaders that I'm grateful for and who has helped shape this budget and ensure really that it is student focused. Um, with that, I will uh, start us off and I am proud to present our FY22 budget on behalf of Superintendent Caselius and our team. You may notice at the start that we're missing a big member of our team, David Bloom. After an incredibly long year, I am happy to take a brief moment of celebration. David's daughter was born last Tuesday. Um, so he is not with us, he is home with his family. And um, I can tell you, um, having seen pictures that she is both adorable and she's already shown a strong commitment to equity, efficiency and transparency as is uh, typical of our budget team. Uh, mom, baby, and dad are all doing well, and I assured David that I wouldn't mess this up too badly without him tonight. My last comment before getting into the presentation is a, a note of gratitude, and I want to echo the sentiments of gratitude that the superintendent brought forth this evening. This year, doing our regular jobs has taken what has felt like an extraordinary effort. Since the district closed schools in March, the budget team has been in a nearly constant sprint and it has felt like budget season extended really from March through February of this year. Supporting departments in how they think about their new costs in our new reality. Tonight, I'll be joined by Miriam Rubin, our new budget director. She has been an incredible addition to our budget team having joined us uh, recently in July. Yvonne McRae has been critical in putting this budget together and has brought her experience by starting as grants director this fall. And of course, our budget team, Chris Williams, Tressa Gennati, Regine Martin, Blair Dawkins, Mary Gillen, and Athena Arasso. They have all worked tirelessly to support 123 schools and 47 central office departments. I owe them a debt of gratitude for helping me prepare to present this budget this evening. Mr. Cooter, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to um, say uh, I, I um, just have seen some messages in the chat. If people could just slow down, just a reminder. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you for the reminder. Our collective urgency to close opportunity and achievement gaps was the foundation of this budget. We started our budget process again this year, rooted in this statement from the opportunity and achievement gap policy. As COVID-19 has revealed the economic, health, and education disparities many of us knew were present before the pandemic, we need to redouble our efforts to close those gaps and guarantee excellent education for all students. By focusing on those students who need public education the most and providing intensive supports to the schools that are struggling to improve, we can ensure that all students have the same opportunity to achieve greatness. We need to maintain this focus as we guarantee an excellent education for all students. The FY22 budget, a proposed $1.29 billion general fund allocation, features targeted investments in academic health and wellness and community supports. These investments are aligned to the five-year BPS strategic plan and the proposed funding to strategies with demonstrated ability to improve outcomes for the district's highest need students. Over 95% of this proposal represents direct services to students through funding to schools. Combined with our proposals in school services budgeted centrally, 100% of our investment, the 100% of the $36 million of new investments will see an immediate and direct impact on the experience of our students in our schools. In two years, we have transformed our foundation for quality, 
guaranteeing all students in all school, school communities critical resources. We will talk more about this investment later, but it's worth echoing and emphasizing that over the last two years, we've added 142 social workers, including 95 new social workers in the budget this year, and have added 117 family liaisons, including 80.5 new positions funding multilingual family supports. We know that COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on students of color, English learners, students with disabilities, and students and families, families experiencing poverty. In order to help them recover from this disruption to their lives and to their education, we must prepare a multi-year plan to support students in three critical areas. The first, of course, is academic supports. We must address the unfinished learning and provide individualized academic support for English learners and students with disabilities. We also wanna focus on health and wellness supports. Overall, physical, mental, and, and mental health and physical health is a community-wide concern. And finally, we're focused on community supports in building that authentic relationship with all stakeholders and with families to make sure that they have access to their school community and supports that they need to be successful. The pandemic has also had a significant impact on our district. This graphic represents the conversation about enrollment projections that we started at the school committee's retreat in December. At our school's hearing next week, we will revisit the discussion of enrollment changes. In the meantime, some important context about the enrollment realities are worth noting. Total actual enrollment is projected to decline by 4.3%. And the, that, is, that de decline is represented in the 2,200 students less that we saw in October 2020 than in prior year. This is significant because it represents the largest drop in 15 years, in the last 15 years. This is also the third consecutive year of significant enrollment declines. And enrollment has dropped by 4,700 students over the last three years. The decline is most pronounced in our early elementary grades, which has declined about 1,800 students. And that means that enrollment in grades K0 through five has now dropped about 3,500 students or 12.4% over the last three years. These enrollment changes are real and significant. Later on, Miriam will explain how we've done more though to support schools outside of weighted student funding than we have in any prior year. And because students of color are in schools experiencing higher than average school decline, we knew that this support was a critical equity strategy going into this budget planning process. The path to recovery for our students and for our district will be long, but we are in a strong financial position to launch this work. At a time when other mayors are expecting dramatic cuts to school budgets, we will progress towards these goals with new investments from the city that to, to expand upon their three-year $100 million commitment. I don't think I'm overstating it when I say that Boston stands apart for its financial commitment to schools. Few of my colleagues in Massachusetts or throughout the nation are talking about major investments coming out of this pandemic. It's remarkable that during a time of great uncertainty that the mayor would step up and provide additional investments to BPS and take the step beyond the maintenance budget to increase our support. This is over and above $80 million increase last year in new investments and in our maintenance cost. This is despite declining enrollment and stable operating costs, including stable salaries, we are seeing an increase in nearly $1,700 per pupil. Approximately $21,800 was spent per pupil last year in fiscal 21. We're seeing the increase to $23,500 per pupil in the next year. This is a big deal. And it's taking a significant com commitment from the city during a period of financial instability for our community. While tonight's focus is on the FY22 operating budget, the superintendent is leveraging three financial resources to fulfill her vision for our students. When used thoughtfully, these three resources, these three sources of funds 
represent a tremendous opportunity to support students and make lasting change in our district. The first source of funding is our operating budget or general funds. This is funding directly from the city. The second source of funding is federal. BPS will receive an approximate 123 million of new funding from the um, ESSER part two funding. This was part of the Coronavirus Response and Relief Act passed by the United States Congress. BPS plans to use additional funds to address critical needs within the community due to the pandemic. Throughout this presentation, you'll notice that we are highlighting investments that, are, that we are planning in both the BPS operating budget and investments that we are planning to fund through ESSER part two. Having just received our allocation uh, last week, we are not presenting a full and comprehensive budget for ESSER part two tonight. We will come back to you with our vision for how we will use those funds to address our critical needs at a hearing in March. The last source of funding is our capital budget, funding that we'll use to improve our facilities. This year, the superintendent, the superintendent is doing more to create a cohesive strategy across our operating capital budgets. And I'm looking forward to presenting our capital budget proposal to the school committee in March. As we evaluate how to use our resources, we're focused on those investments that will have an impact beyond a single year. We have an obligation to develop a sustainability plan for any new investments, particularly those paid for with federal relief funds. For each of the funding sources, I wanted to highlight the risks associated with new investments that are either misaligned to our vision or do not have a plan for sustainability. I first became budget director as the district was dealing with the last federal funding cliff fueled by ARA and the federal government's Race to the Top program. Earlier this year, we worked with a team of students from Harvard to conduct research on how districts dealt with the loss of that federal funding um, almost a decade ago. They found that saving and creating jobs are inherently ongoing expenses, and that as ARA funds dried up before the economy fully recovered, districts across the US experienced delayed funding cliffs and were forced to make changes and cuts to their budget to get back within their total operating budgets. Districts which experienced the largest funding cliffs were those that front-loaded spending in the first year of the program and focused on job creation in the way that they spent their funds. The risk in adding new staff and using these funds with a lack of plan for how to fund it afterwards um, is one of the concerns that we're addressed with. And I would be negligent if I didn't mention that as we invest in supporting schools with declining enrollment, we need a long-term plan for how to address our overall capacity. It's important that we are still reducing capacity in our system that is no longer needed if we do not anticipate enrollment to bounce back to pre-COVID levels. This will allow us to focus our resources on supporting the students we continue to enroll rather than maintain capacity for students who are no longer here. While the challenge facing our district is daunting, we are excited to present a student-centered fiscal 2022 budget. Um, the proposed budget is framed with the guiding principles of return, recover, and reimagine. The recovery budget is heavily focused on improving student outcomes, advancing equitable recovery, and promoting the whole school, the whole school community's health and wellness amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. The five-year strategic plan is our roadmap for success. And this budget is guided in that original vision and we are anchoring it and focusing on ways to become an anti-racist school district. That we know that this work is not only structural and systematic, but it is also adaptive. And we need to change the minds, policies, and resources that's taken to fulfill this vision. To that end, we are highlighting investments aligned to the three guiding principles of return, recover, and reimagine. In return, we're focusing on getting all students and staff back into buildings when it's safe to do so, and then get back to the work we love and return even stronger. We are focusing our recover efforts to repair the damage done by COVID by better understanding where students are, assess their learning, target interventions, and add support aligned to those expectations for what outcomes we wanna see. And of course, we need to reimagine. We need to come back as a district that we need to be for all students. In each of these sections, we're gonna be highlighting 
the questions that we asked ourselves at the start of the planning process. These critical questions that needed to inform the budget work when we began it back in October. The first focus in our budget and in our work is on return to get all students and staff back into buildings. I wanna highlight one critical investment that we're, we have on the operating budget in particular. Um, we know a lot about our facilities has been a, a topic of conversation and it's focused for both our staff and our students and families. This pandemic of course did not create a facilities emergency. It simply shined a light on the challenge we're facing. To prepare our schools for a safe return, we're making investments in new custodians and increasing our sp spending on facilities maintenance contracts. Our goal is simple. We want buildings to be a point of pride and for our students to have access to the latest technology for learning in the, in the best and cleanest environments. We know that our school environments impact learning. Our job is to ensure facilities support learning by investing in building condition and cleanliness. We're highlighting the 1.4 million investment in custodians as part of the operating budget. Each of the presentation segments will have the slide that shows what's on our current operating budget and those places where we've earmarked money in the ESSER part two funding. Um, you'll notice that we have identified some items in that ESSER part two funding, which includes additional spending to continue many of the items that we have added this year during COVID. We recognize that many of our operating costs from hand sanitizers to new technology resources will need to be continued through next school year and possibly beyond. And we've begun to think about what are those new expectations that will um, continue next year. And so um, with that, I'm gonna transition the conversation on recover category um, and that's um, gonna be handed off to Miriam for, the, for this section. Thank you, Nate, and good evening, everybody. Um, so our focus for Recover is to really ensure that school communities have what they need to not only repair the damage done by COVID-19, but also to create the conditions in which students and families can thrive. In order to do this, we see it as essential to both provide stability to school communities despite declining enrollment and to invest in social, emotional, and family supports. As Nate mentioned earlier, I wanna just note that I'll focus tonight on outlining the recovery and recover investments that we plan to allocate on BPS general funds. We're equally excited about the opportunities we have to use ESSER funds for more immediate recovery efforts and also look forward to deep diving deeper into those investments with you in upcoming hearings. Our first priority in the area of recover is to mitigate the impact of student enrollment declines on the student experience. Over the last 10 years, we have become conditioned to immediately associate enrollment declines with difficult cuts to school budgets. It's the reality of weighted student funding in a district. This year, however, like many other districts across the country, the enrollment declines we are seeing are unprecedented. Unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball and have no way of knowing for sure what the future holds regarding these declines. What we do know though, is that these enrollment declines and the potential cuts associated with them would have had a disproportionate impact on our Black and Latinx students, English learners and students with disabilities. We also know our students and schools have seen enough instability within the current context of our world and that it is our responsibility to mitigate that instability as much as possible. To that end, we have committed to ensuring that schools do not have to make the cuts that you might typically see with these types of declines. Instead, we have invested $18.5 million beyond the typical soft landing support we provide to schools to supplement their allocation through weighted student funding. While we have still needed to make some difficult decisions around the capacity of our schools and have closed classrooms in places where longer term enrollment trends indicated it was necessary to do so. This investment has gone to ensuring that schools don't have to cut the support staff and programs that are so essential to the educational experience of our students.
COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of providing additional social, emotional, and family supports to, to our schools and students. For that reason, as part of Recover, we've proposed an acceleration of our rollout of these supports by investing in 81 new family liaisons and 95 so new social worker positions for next year. These investments, combined with our nursing investments from two years ago, will be critical components to a broader hub schools model that supports school communities in responding rapidly to student and family needs and coordinating supports across schools. Our new investments of family liaisons build upon the investment we made last year in our transformation schools by ensuring that all schools will have one full-time family liaison in their building for fiscal year 22. The liaisons that were hired this past year are truly reflective of the racial, cultural, and linguistic diversity of the BPS community and have been able to build deep and authentic relationships with our families throughout this difficult year. They've been critical assets to school communities as they have helped families navigate challenges presented by the pan pandemic and connected them to community resources related to housing, food access, counseling, and more. We believe that it is essential for BCS families to have at all schools to have trusted points of contact reflective of the school community to go to when questions and challenges arise. And that, and we believe that this investment is an important step to ensuring that this is possible. Our new investment in social workers is also built upon our FY21 investment, moving beyond our initial investment of social workers in transformation schools last year. Um, the investment will bring at least a 0.5 social worker into every BPS school. As with family liaisons, we've worked hard to ensure that social workers are culturally, linguistically, and racially reflective of our students. And are, and are also receiving the training necessary to be culturally responsive to our school community. This year, in partnership with our Office of Student and Community Impact, students have worked closely with their schools have worked closely with their equity roundtables and school site councils to integrate these investments into their schools' racial equity strategies and ensure that their new social workers are well equipped to honor different methods of healing with their students. To that end, social workers will be providing both individual student and family support, while also working to address racist and harmful structures and conditions in school, and contributing to the design and implementation of school-wide culturally and linguistically sustaining practices used as an in using an intersectional anti-racist lens. You can see here the breakdown by dollar amount of our recover, recover investments, and also a preview of the investments in this area that we plan to put forth in on ESSER funds. You will notice that 70% of investments in this category, the investments that I just mentioned, are in fact being placed on general funds because we believe deeply that these funds need to be here for the long term. And so we are intentional about putting them on this allocation. We are hopeful that the investments that we are putting forth in the category of recover are laying a strong foundation for the reimagine work that Chief Cooter is now going to talk about. Nate, with that, I'll hand it back to you. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we are challenged to reimagine our district. We need to come back as the district that our students need us to be and all students need us to be. There's really no going back to a pre-2020 world and with good reason. That system wasn't working for too many students, especially students of color. We do not seek to get back to normal. We seek to disrupt normal and transform into the district our students need and deserve. We are launching the work of reimagine for our schools and for our district. And we need to remove the structures that limit our ability to realize our vision for students. We know that the support we are offering this year that, that Miriam just covered is a stopgap measure 
as we redesign our district to be what it needs to be to meet the needs of students. This includes important work around Bill BPS, inclusive strategies and look act implementation, and of course, high, high school redesign. Our awareness of the challenges facing our district has increased during this pandemic, but they are not new. In many ways, we need to return to the key levers highlighted in the long-term financial plan created almost five years ago. That includes a focus in several areas, facilities and learning environments, where we accelerate the conversations about the district footprint and grade configurations in light of enrollment declines, inclusive strategies where we're putting special education students at the center of our planning, also making sure inclusive opportunities is the default for all students. We also need to innovate new English learner programs, paying particular attention to programs that meet the needs of English learners with disabilities. And finally, we're introducing the concept of school-based investments to reimagine schools, practices, and structures, um, inclu including regional investments to foster collaboration and innovation among schools. We want to expand early childhood programs that launch a student's career. We want to transform the experience of students in the middle grades, and we must continue to think about increasing quality and access to opportunities across all of our high schools. Our plan is to focus our March 9th hearing on the central office and on our strategy to leverage the SR Part 2 funding. And we'll provide more information about how we will approach the use of these funds to invest in the changes we need to make to the district. In addition to my earlier comments on inclusion in high schools, I want to highlight our commitment to becoming an anti-racist district. This includes an investment in ethnic studies and are based on our desire to become a more culturally and linguistically sustaining district. But it also includes our efforts to create the conditions and structures to close achievement gaps. We will continue to challenge our team to address a number of issues related to exam school access, social justice and restorative justice practices, innovation and programming to attract, promote and retain educators of color and to constructively disrupt racist institutions and practices with equitable learning and development systems. To all of this, to do all of this work will require a high performing central office. And while we continue to evaluate efficiencies and the existing work portfolios of our existing staff, we are also considering investments to support the critical work and ensure that we are not expecting different results with the same resources. And finally, I wanna highlight the superintendent's proposal to foster innovation and engage with school communities. By leveraging and the knowledge and expertise of those who are closest to students we serve and committing to funding their innovation and collaboration, we believe we'll create the conditions for substantial, meaningful and sustained change in our district. And now we'll talk about some of our high level numbers. The most important number, of course, is 52,280. That is our projected number of students for, F for our next fiscal year. The fact that we are projecting a decline of 2,574 students makes this level of investment that we're covering even more remarkable. Our full budget is available online in Excel and PDF. It's also going to be translated and available by the next budget hearing. However, if you want to familiarize yourself with the budget in one table, this is it. We've broken our budget into four main categories. The first is direct school expenses. Those items budgeted on school budgets. This represents the largest portion of our budget, over 64% of our total operating budget. School services budgeted centrally is a long way of saying those items that are located in a central budget, but you'll actually find the resources in schools. This includes items like school custodians. School services budgeted centrally makes up nearly 25% of our budget. The third category is central administration. What you think of when you think of central office. Uh, this includes the superintendent, the central academics team, and other central operation supports. This makes up only 5.4% of our overall budget. And finally, we've categorized non-BPS student services. Those services like transportation to charter schools that we provide students in non-BPS schools. 
Non-BPS student services represents 5.5% of our overall $1.3 billion budget. The final segment of our presentation tonight is our equity analysis. We continue to replicate the methodology used in the last two years to ensure that most resources are directed to students with the highest needs. Boston Public Schools wants to guarantee every child access to quality schools and academic and enriching experience. In the past, our guarantee of foundational funding has been very limited. And last year, we made significant, significant investments to raise that bar. This year, our focus has been on stabilizing school experience despite enrollment declines. The city's commitment of $36 million in new investments allows us the opportunity to have this conversation about the strategic resources differently. And we're committed to ongoing conversations about equity and parity. How do we differentiate based on needs of students while guaranteeing consistent student experiences across our portfolio of schools? In the meantime, in Boston, the equity analysis shows that when we focus on making sure we raise the bar in quality, we are also making an equity-based investment. As you remember, over the last three years, we've made significant progress in understanding our spending across these different um, student demographic groups. Two years ago, we took steps to attach each dollar of spending to specific students. For example, we divided our summer school budget up based on the number of students who attended summer school. As part of this analysis, we found that while some parts of our budget are relatively evenly spread, such as central office supports, other parts are intentionally allocated differentially to students. For example, weighted student funding intentionally invests more money in higher need students through direct certification, our measure of low income status, the opportunity index, which measures both students' economic situation, academic experience, and neighborhood factors, and then also other measures that, that are focused on student need. Our spending on transportation, special education, and English learners are also differentiated to reflect investments in higher needs communities. When we add these investments up, we find that we make larger investments in our Black and Latinx students relative to our white and Asian students. And while we are proud that our budget shows this progressive differentiation, which is not the case in many other districts, we believe that greater differentiation are, is needed to close opportunity gaps for our highest needs and historically marginalized populations. We've taken each of the new investments and allocated them out to the students that they are supporting. And the first investment and our biggest investment in stabilizing schools was, um, as Miriam highlighted, the school supports for declining enrollment. Due to the decline in enrollment this year and the uncertain impact of COVID and the likelihood students will return in some capacity to our district, we wanted to stabilize programs and capacity. Students in schools experience the highest decline in enrollment are more likely to be high need students and those in historically marginalized populations, particularly our Black and Latinx students. As a result, this investment to support our schools will direct almost $200 more per pupil to Black and Latinx students than to Asian and white students. Similarly, it will direct almost $200 more to low-income students than to non-low-income students. This is our second year of an investment in to ensure that every school has a 1.0 FTE family liaison. And this will be especially important as ever as we return from COVID. Lower investments in Latinx and EL students are reflected this year's investment as a result of this being a two year investment. Um, and on the next slide, we show that this is the investment over the two years with the dark blue part of the bar showing the investment we made last year in family liaisons and the light blue bar at the top showing the total investment um, with the two years. When you look over two years, last year's investment shows that we are ensuring parity and access to it and that the, it balances out English learners because they were the focus of, of the investment last year. As Miriam mentioned, we're also guaranteeing a minimum of a 0.5 social worker 
with increased allocations based on the number of students enrolled in the school who are experiencing poverty. This investment shows relative parity with only marginal differences funding going to Black and Latinx students. Similar to family liaisons, this is the second year of expanding access to social workers. And in this slide, we combine the fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22 investments to show that overall, this investment in social workers across the district was rooted in an effort to promote equity while guaranteeing access to all schools and all students. And our final investment this, that we did an equity analysis on is custodians, adding 20 new custodians, including five substitute custodians that support all schools. Small differences in the poor pupil amounts do not indicate an equity focus for this investment as it really is focused on building conditions and the physical buildings, um, uh, the physical needs of buildings. Overall, although many of the investments are targeted to support a specific group, every student benefited from at least one central, uh, one investment that we are making in this year's budget. Overall, our spending this year, our new investments this year, makes our budget even more equitable. In addition to increasing the overall spending for students, we are also increasing our spending gap. Additional dollars that we put towards higher needs group, like students with disabilities, English learners, low income students, and black and Latinx families. Finally, I just want to note that our, our budget team is committed to transparency and making sure that all of our, our materials are available to students. Uh, to, to all families and all students. And so online tonight, you can go to bostonpublicschools.org slash budget and find copies of this presentation, um, FY22 weighted student funding school by school comparisons. So you can look at the budget for any individual school and the allocations they received. And you can also find the preliminary budget proposal uh, by account, program and department so that you can dive into the details of our budget. As I mentioned earlier, all, budgets, all budget documents are being translated and will be available by the next budget hearing, which is next week. And finally, I'll just give a preview of coming attractions. We have a number of hearings coming up over the next few months, and I look forward to uh, engaging with the community, the school committee, and hearing feedback on this proposal. Um, the next school hearing will be next week and focused on school budgets. Um, we will then present on March 9th on uh, focused on central office and come back with a, more details about our plan for the SR2 COVID relief funding. Um, and then later in March, we will also be coming back with information on our capital budget. And with that, I will turn it back over to our chairperson for questions. And thank you all for allowing me to present. Uh, thank you, Chief Cooter and Ms. Rubin for your presentation. Um, and I will now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. If you can raise your hand either virtually or through your box. Uh, Dr. Rivera. Um, yes, so th thank you again, um, May and your team. Um, I had a question about um, where we might, well, so first, you know, again, to acknowledge and thank all of the, the, the testimonies today about, you know, Black Lives Matter week and also, um, you know, our district becoming anti-racist. And that was mentioned in slide 22. Um, and so my question is about, you know, where, where would the funding be for ethnic studies? Um, would that be in those, those categories you described in slide 25, like would it be budgeted centrally or would that be programmatic support? I'm not, I'm not sure like if I'm trying to find where, where the funding will be for ethnic studies, where would, where would I look for that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think there's a couple different pieces that will come from um, the, the funding around ethnic studies. Um, part of it is included in, in, our, in the sort of bucket around becoming an anti-racist district and thinking about cultural and linguistically sustaining practices. 
Um, part of when we make investments as a central office, there's a component of it that is professional development and curricular curriculum development. Those uh, parts of the investment are um, our central office investments in our academics team and, and our chief accountability officer, um, Andrea Zayas, would oversee the implementation of that um, and the development of curricular resources um, in that way. And I think um, the second part are the, of course, the staff and the positions that will be teaching those courses. And those would be funded in individual school budgets and would become part of the um, the, the sort of staff and program and core. At times we will launch programs and fund positions. Um, uh, an example of that could be um, positions that we're adding to um, the Mather as it launches its dual language Vietnamese program. Um, and in other times it will be identifying resources within a school budget. So um, that may not necessarily show up in how a position is coded in the budget, but it, it's ensuring that it is sustainable practices. So um, this, this ended up becoming a bit of a long-winded answer, I feel like, but it's, if it's about development of resources, to, uh, acquiring the curriculum and professional development, that tends to be central. And then the staff to support the program and, and the actual teachers are on the school budgets. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Burr, Mr. James. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to Mr. Cooter and his team um, and the superintendent for presenting um, this preliminary budget. Um, I'm, I just wanted to go ahead and say that I, I will be reaching out um, as this is my first time on budget season. And um, I will be reaching out to you, Mr. Cooter, for some assistance on how to sort of um, read through the packet and all that good stuff. But I guess my first question is, um, my only question really as of right now <laughs> is, um, when will we be hearing about budget cuts? Because I know, I know they exist and I, I didn't hear about them. Um, I, I really look forward to spending time with you and going through the budget. Um, and I think um, there are so many materials online and so many different ways to access this. Um, you know, I think we, we've said it in the abstract and part of the reason we started with um, uh, Ms. Vernaza coming and talking is, and, and she, she jokingly said that every year she comes and does uh, battle with me. A lot of our school leaders were, were bracing for budget cuts in the way that you traditionally think of it coming into a year where we have this significant enrollment. Um, but as uh, Miriam stated, we knew that there's enough instability in our students' experience from this year that we needed to stabilize their school experience going into next year. And so that was the 18.5 million in additional soft landings and supports for schools to help stabilize the experience. And so our commitment was to make sure that you weren't losing access to rigorous coursework that you had just because we have less students projected that we weren't seeing cuts to librarians or social workers, which we've struggled with in the past, right? We've had difficult conversations about in the past. And so a lot of the cuts that you are expecting schools to come out and say and talk about, they're not there because we are funding them going into next year. Um, we do have a couple of schools. So what you would see is as you review our school budgets, one of the ways to look is there is a uh, department budget table which shows all of our schools. And in it, it shows last year's budget and next year's budget and what the change is. And so one version is to go down that list and see the schools that have a negative number there. Um, what you'll find is a, some very specific examples of schools going through changes. Most notably schools that are changing their programming, um, the Edwards School or the McCormick School, which we closed, um, or really big adjustments. But all other schools, you're not going to see um, budget cuts or declining budgets because we've worked with them individually and supported that programming. Um, and, and you'll excuse me that this is also becoming a long winded answer, but I think it's a really important one in a very different context than we've had in the past um, because we have really been so focused on those student experiences and maintaining um, those programs and services to students at the school level. So going going off on that, since I still have two minutes left, um, I, I did I did sort of you know I was going through the list of schools during your presentation, and I came upon um, Brighton High School, for example, that is going to be um, it, next to Brighton. It, it showed a negative percentage number. Mm -hmm. So what does that represent? 
Yeah, so Brighton High School, um, and we've done a lot of work with Brighton High School in their budget and, and head of school, um, Andrew Bott. Um, we, you know, the, they're one of the schools that is experiencing a significant enrollment decline. Um, and we, what we wanted to do is um, both support the programming. So we've, we've worked with him to identify um, what courses he's offering. Um, this is also his uh, first year at Brighton High. So he's thinking about how does he create inclusive opportunities? How does he create more rigorous programming for the students at Brighton? And so he's doing some restructuring. Um, and we've done that in the light of what will, what, what is a reasonable assumption around returning enrollment for that school um, because they've seen such significant enrollment decline? And so what he did was identify in his new vision for the school some positions that he and some capacity that we are taking offline in terms of the number of, um, in the number of teachers and, and staff. And so it represents not a change, you know, they may need a different number of teachers to run, the, run their schedule, but it doesn't mean that they're offering different courses. Um, and so, of course, we are still working with a number of schools. In fact, um, you're reminding me that I was supposed to call uh, Andrew Bott back this afternoon to discuss a couple of pieces of his budget. And we are continuing to work with Brighton High, um, schools like Up Academy. We're still not finalizing that budget and so understanding the impact and making sure that um, we are truly maintaining that student experience. Thank you. I'll save the rest of my questions for the next round. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. James. Ms. Robinson. Um, yes, again, thank you so much for all of the work um, that's been done to date. I have a couple of questions. I'm trying to understand the, the ESSER budget part two. So are those things that, that's going to be paid for by that money for the next year, are we looking to move some of those things from the ESSER funding over to the FY23 budget? Great question. Um, thank you for asking it. Um, the ESSER Part 2 funding um, is allows us to spend over three fiscal years. Th this fiscal year, FY21, next fiscal year, FY22, and the following fiscal year, FY23. So we do, we do get to think about it in, in a couple different buckets. Um, one, one way to think about it is sort of what you're highlighting, which is a down payment on anticipated um, the third year of that $100 million commitment. And this is, again, I would be remiss if I didn't thank, again, the city's commitment, the mayor's commitment, if this is a, one of his lasting um, sort of parting legacy and parting gift to us as a district, is this three-year commitment. So some of them we are anticipating shifting um, you know, things like nursing, some of the nursing costs. And um, as we start to think about some of the costs, there are sort of front loading things that we anticipate adding to our budget in FY23. That's a very limited number. In a lot of cases, what we're thinking of are investments that we can make that are one time, but that shift the way that we do the work. And a, a sort of complicated but interesting example of that is our investment in bus monitors. We have put a multi-million dollar investment in bus monitors, which on the surface is an investment in staff that will be part of the funding cliff that I sort of am concerned about. But one of the things that we find is that people are writing bus monitors into IEPs at a rate higher just so they can guarantee a bus monitor on the bus. And that if we invest in bus monitor technology, if we invest in additional bus monitors up front, we think we can actually lower our long-term costs by sort of showing that we have the staff needed to support students on the bus. And so some of it is, a, is um, an investment now with a commitment to future efficiencies in operations, but that allows us to lower our costs. And so we're also thinking about things like investments in student services outside of the IEP process allows us to lower IEP costs. Because if people don't need to write it into an individualized plan, to get access to a social worker, we may see our lower special education costs. So these are investments in things that we think we will be able to gain efficiencies in the long run, but that we're front loading those costs this year. Okay. Um, my other question um, was looking at your last slide, um, the one that says evolving strategies to, to achieve our vision. 
And one of the things that you talk about in reimagining is closing opportunity gaps in high school. And I guess my thought was, wh where is the comparable side that is talking about preventing the development of gaps in the lower grades? Because you know, otherwise, it looks like we're anticipating as kids move from middle to high school that we will be yet again closing gaps. So I guess somewhat, and maybe this will be when we look at our next um, our next funding piece on central office to looking at things like, you know, where is the work of the Opportunity and Achievement Gaps office and the work that they're doing and how are we looking at what we're funding and doing at lower grades so that as a result, we're finding fewer gaps and we are moving the needle on the issues for black and brown kids by what we are doing in a number of these activities so that we're not having to call, we won't have to continue forever to call out closing gaps. And so I guess it's trying to figure out, you know, how do we think about the budgeting and the, and the experiences at all grade levels um, so that that outcome changes. Um, as always, you continue to ask both the right questions, the hard questions. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this because it is critically important. We're talking about both achievement gaps and opportunity gaps. And in particular, at the high school level, I was highlighting here the need to close opportunity gaps. The core questions we need to ask ourselves are why are there some academic, extracurricular, athletic experiences at some of our high schools, but okay. not at all of our high schools? And when we mm -hmm. think about guaranteeing a foundation for quality, we've started with things like family liaisons and social workers, but the superintendent is is aggressively and urgently asking questions about why can't we offer more AP courses? Mm -hmm. Why are we not offering more athletic experiences? Those are opportunities that are not created because students have different experiences. Those are structural challenges or issues that the district has control over and needs to change. Mm -hmm. I think you're also highlighting really important investments in closing achievement gaps as well. And how do we make sure that our students enter high school ready for more rigorous opportunities and supported. Um, and and I'm, I'm not going to talk about this as well as Chief um, Charles Granson will be able to talk about it or, or uh, Chief Andre Zayas would be able to talk about it from an academic perspective. But I will highlight that's why the superintendent has emphasized early childhood investments and expanding K0, K1, and K2, things that we know are foundational to a student's experience. Mm -hmm. She's also addressing the, the structural and um, course issues at our middle grades. You know, I think we heard from AWC. We heard some advocates reminding us that we've made great investments in Excellence for All about expanding rigorous opportunities for all students, no matter what program, no matter what school they're in, in you know, all fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. I think these are critical investments. And what we, what we will find is as we improve the experience that we offer students, when we improve the opportunity that students have access to, that achievement gaps will then be closed because we have done the hard work of being anti-racist and removing the structures that have gotten in our students' way. And that's part of our vision for this new opportunity. Can we think about this $123 million, not just for what it can provide for recovery, which is critical and important and we need to do, but also can it fundamentally change the trajectory of our students by changing the tra trajectory of our, of our district? I would just add also the focus on addressing the sub-separate programs for our students um, and the way that we refer students to special ed. You know, the fact that we have 22% of our students in special ed is not okay, and that 39% are in separate programs. Um, and that's going to be really working with our community and helping them understand that smaller doesn't necessarily mean better. Um, and that we want to have more inclusionary opportunities for all students as the default. You heard uh, Chief Cooter talk about that earlier. And um, so that is highly critical. The other key piece, and both of these items are in my superintendent evaluation because there are strong values and strong priorities for me, is the, our English language learners. And what are we doing through our Look Act um, and our dual language programs 
our cultural proficiency and linguistic proficiency for our students? And how do we look at um, creating greater opportunity access for more inclusionary opportunities for students to access rigor who are in EL and our particular students who are both EL and special ed categorized? So those are some ways that we'll be able to use some of that $123 million uh, to spawn new innovation at school levels with grade level teams, with our teacher teams, to look at our services and our supports for specific populations of students. And we also received uh, feedback in our last school retreat and last school committee from several of the members of our community asking us to take a much sharper focus on economically disadvantaged students. So, uh, we'll be going back to our community around all of these areas in order to better meet the needs and make sure every student gets what they need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent. Um, before I move back to Mr. James, is, is there any other school committee member that wants to go in this first round? Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. James? I think Mr. O'Neill read. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Vice Chair. I didn't see you. I apologize. I think Dr. Coleman in indicated as well. Dr. Coleman, did you want to speak? Yeah, I think he spoke uh, no, I said no, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. So, uh, Mr. Kuda, thank you, first of all, to you and to the entire team, because I know this is not a solo effort. There's uh, been an enormous amount of people um, helping you on this. And I know you're, uh, this is a marathon to get uh, to a budget process. Um, you're not on Beacon Street, yes, or Boylston Street, yes, unfortunately, but maybe you're at Heartbreak Hill. But um, to those of us in the school committee and to the public, we now start a two month process of looking through this. So um, I will have a number of uh, questions and comments during the course of the two months, because like my fellow members, I'll be diving in on that very thick binder uh, we received late this afternoon um, and the information that's online to really understand it. And, and you know, we have the process of the budget hearings to go through where we focus on the schools, we focus on central office, we get a chance to both dig in a little bit deeper, but also reflect the input we receive from our community and the schools um, and those impacted. So we're at the beginning now of a, of a two month process. So I more just want to ask more of a philosophical question at the beginning. I do appreciate um, the presentation and how you framed it and, and the emphasis on the federal funding and the fact that it is available to us to spend over three years, as you said, for this fiscal year that we're in right now, the next fiscal year and all the way into 23. And, and I do want to caution us to be very careful in how we spend that because the risk of spending it on positions is when that federal funding goes away two years from now, which happens in a blink of an eye, we now, if we don't have funding for that, we're now eliminating positions. And this committee and this district has in the past um, spent thinking funds are gonna continue. And when it doesn't, uh, we're in a very difficult situation. So just being thoughtful about that upfront is really important. And I appreciate that you called that out I wanna go back to a comment that was made um, during public comment because I, I, it's a great sentence. And, and that is just philosophically, talk to me, Mr. Kuda, how you try to have a budget that captures the needs of all of our students. And I do appreciate the increased emphasis on nursing, increased emphasis on social workers, increased emphasis on um, uh, family liaisons increased emphasis on transformational schools, the attempt to um, mitigate what would have been cuts to use the, the thoughtful question that Mr. James asked um, and, and your answer on that. But how do we have a, a base budget? And I know Ms. Robinson has asked this many times over the years. You know, when we think about every school having a library, having a gym, having, you know, at our elementary schools, having an arts program and, and balancing the difficulty of doing that with declining enrollment. Um, but it sounds like you put a number of supports in. So 
help me out with your thinking on a budget that captures the needs of all of our students. I think that's a, a, an amazing question. And, um, you know, I mentioned at the start of this that, um, you know, as a Boston resident and a BPS parent, I, I really do think about this budget from a very simple lens in that I want every school to be a school that I want to send my kid to. Um, and, and I think when I think about the resources that are at my, my son and daughter's school, um, I want to figure out ways to make that a possibility for all. Um, and so I do think it starts with, uh, from, a, from the chief financial officer perspective, um, what is our funding mechanism? How do we utilize that funding mechanism to meet our goal for our vision for students? And what are the things that are getting in the way of that? And you've noticed over the last few years, the finance team has gotten more involved in things like Bill BPS and in the capital planning, because it does, we do think about removing the structures and some of the ways that our system is not engineered to provide those resources to all students. You mentioned a school with a gym, like that is a capital problem. We need to think about that. And so Superintendent Caselius came in here with a very different approach to budgeting and, uh, you know, really pushed our thinking around, like you have weighted student funding, but at the end of the day, I want to see these things in a school and started to increase the expectations of these resources need to be in a school and the funding mechanism needs to get us there or we need to change the, the, the underlying reason for that. And so we do think about and have been listening to the community about what are those resources focused on family liaisons and social workers this year, because that's what we've heard from our community and we continue to iterate. And of course, you've been here for, for, the, for a long time, the implementation of weighted student funding as a push for equity that has revealed some of the inequities in our system. So, um, so I do think that that is part of our approach. Um, the last thing I'll just say in terms of our philosophy is we really start our budget process with enrollment projections. And part of that is both a practical and a philosophical starting point. It's who are the students that we're gonna serve? And then it starts with a conversation with our school leaders because they know our students, they know our students needs better than we do. We can provide resources by listening to our school leaders and by amplifying their voice in the process and continuing to have that conversation with them. So we, we spend hours and, and Miriam and her team have spent um, the last three weeks meeting with every single school leader about their budget, what they're trying to accomplish, what their challenges are. And that is really by listening to those voices and by ensuring that um, we're elevating that to the superintendent so that she can look at our overall strategy for guaranteeing, guaranteeing that quality. Um, so I think that that may not have been the clearest of sort of answer, but it really does get to some of the core tenants that we have and um, why we've invested so much in this foundation for quality. Um, and guaranteeing it. We're going to see that foundation for quality apply to the capital budget and move in that direction as well. It's time for us to start guaranteeing higher quality opportunities for all our students. Thank you, Mr. Kudo. And as I said, this is the start of a two-month conversation, so I'll reserve my um, comments and questions. I, you know I'm going to have plenty of them over the course of two months. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, and I do have to let you know, Madam Chair, I'm going to have to sign off a bit early this evening for another matter. I apologize for that. Okay, thank you for letting us know. Uh, Mr. James, back to you. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to echo Mr. O'Neill's points. Um, I will, I will too, have um, a lot of questions over the next two months as I dig into this um, this budget proposal. Um, FYI, I sent you an email, Mr. Cooter, um, about suggesting times when we can meet. But um, I guess my my last question. Um, and I, I look forward to it. I don't, you know, I don't expect it to be answered in full tonight. I look forward to exploring this question over the next two months. But in the spirit of connectivity, you know, looking at what we did with the um, exam schools admissions policy and the students that are going to be expected to entering our exam schools, how has your team allocated funds to the exam schools? 
to ensure that we're supporting our incoming students in a different way when it comes to making sure that the transition is much more smoother? And what ideas, if any, has um, your team or other departments you may be working with have thought of to implement some sort of infrastructure or program that is funded that um, really supports our incoming students? Um, I think it's, again, another great question and important question. Um, part of the, you know, what we've been dealing with over the last few years is, is changing and emerging conditions and trying to create financial flexibility to deal with um, what we cannot predict. I think last year when I was presenting the budget, and of course I've reviewed it, like we could not have anticipated what we were about to enter uh, for the year. Um, in our budget, we have some reserves and there's a detail of our reserves um, in the packet of materials that's posted online and that you received um, as part of this that includes um, reserves for anticipated spending throughout the year. And so we have one sort of strategic enrollment reserve. Um, the idea being that we, we know that we know our enrollment projections are going to miss something. And so what happens is um, throughout the spring, when we start to do student assignments, we will review what students are enrolling at what schools and what their needs are. And if we haven't appropriately budgeted for it, we will add those supports. The exam school funding, um, as we evaluate their new assignments, um, will likely be part of that process. And of course, we're really doing something very different and evaluating um, you know, what are the needs of the students that are being assigned and how are they different? Of course, I think there's also, um, you know, there may be different uh, either English learner needs or um, need profiles for special education that the exam schools haven't seen yet or are seen in the recent. And we will be prepared to add that staffing to, to support those students, um, ensuring that, again, uh, we, we maintain equity throughout the system and that we're we're funding the needs of, of similar students in other settings um, as we would in the exam schools. Thank you. And um, I'm really Scott? looking forward to, to a, a conversation. I will definitely include our student CFO, who I know that uh, you know uh, as well, and I think who's watching tonight will have uh, many questions for me as well. I'm, I'm looking forward to that conversation. Uh, Ms. Robinson? No, nope, you just had your hand up, I, okay. Um, all right, so I also want to say thank you, um, Chief Cooter and your team, because I know it's a lot of work um, and it's, it's a long process, so I appreciate everybody. And I definitely want to thank the mayor for um, the additional investment um, when other cities are not seeing um, this type of investment. So <clears throat> definitely, definitely grateful for that. I, um, I, I echo... Um, uh, Vice Chair O'Neill's comments in terms of the presentation and really just being thoughtful um, not to add, you know, a slew of new staff that later we will face a funding cliff. So I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of that. Um, and I just want to say the, that the social workers, um, I'm so glad to see that because of the trauma and devastation, you know, that our students have faced, are facing, and as we've seen, um, you know, in um, other parts of the country, some really devastating things happening with our students. So I'm really, really glad to see that. Um, I only have one, one comment and it does not have to be answered. I just wanna say that um, in about 20 years ago, um, we had investments of family engagement people. Every school had a family engagement person, which is great. Um, I would only say that um, Part of, think, part of the challenge was that many of the family engagement um, specialists were pulled in many directions. Um, they were constantly pulled to be interpreters if they spoke another language um, and just pulled in all kinds of directions. So I just want to say that I think it's wonderful and I think it's great. I've always, you know, advocated for that, um, that every school should have one, but that, you know, part of it is also the culture of the school and making sure that everybody understands that it's not one person's job to engage families and that it's really every single person in the building um, and it's that person like should not be the holder. So that's all I wanna say, it doesn't need an answer. Um, 
And again, thank you so much for all the work because I know that it's a lot of work and I look forward to hearing um, the rest of um, the presentations as we move along. I know I will also have um, additional uh, questions. So um, thanks everybody again. I just wanna remind everybody that tonight marks the beginning of a dynamic two month budget process. And we have a series of budget hearings scheduled over the next several weeks, starting Thursday, February 11th at 5 p.m. You can review all of the budget documents online at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash budget. You can email your comments to budget at bostonpublicschools.org. And of course, you can email the committee by visiting the committee's webpage bostonpublicschools.org forward slash school committee. Your input is critical as we consider the superintendent's budget recommendations for the next fiscal year. The committee will vote on the superintendent's final fiscal year 22 budget recommendations at our meeting on March 24th. And we will now move on to public comment on reports. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. We have no speakers for public comment on reports. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. I would now open it up if there's any new business. Dr. Rivera. Uh, yes, um, I wanted to, again, I'm not sure if this is the right place to do this, but um, you know, I do personally support um, uh, Mr. James and just a student representative having a vote. And my understanding is that it's it's really a state, um, uh, the, the state legislature to, to make that uh, decision. Um, I also understand that city councilor uh, Anissa Saibi George um, has put forward um, some request, or I'm not sure what it's called, but how do what can we do? Um, because when I hear the testimony, um, you know. Of course, we we believe. I think that you know most of us believe that this is equitable to have the student rep have a vote. What can we do? Can we write a letter? I'm just curious if, if or can we put this on an agenda for a future meeting and figure this out? But um, yeah, it's it's been too long, and I'm just curious. What can we do as a committee? Thank you, Dr. Vera. Is there any other comments on that or questions? No, I would agree with um, Dr. Rivera. I think we've we've had this question for a number of years. So this is not, I mean, Mr. James is certainly pushing the issue forward, but I think for, for several years, I've had the same question about, we're asking the student to do the same thing that we're doing yet there their opportunities and their abilities to have their voices heard are different. So the question is, how do we go about doing this with the help of the, with help of, um, the city council? Um, you know, I've tried to look into it online just to understand the role of student uh, members in school districts because there are many that have them, but it, it feels like the, um, where it all stands right now, it's the very same issue. You are a, a member, but you are not a voting member. So I think it's, I think since we do have the question, um, we should talk to the state um, school board to find out what the options are. Right. Or how can we make sure that the voice is heard? I mean, I hear what students are saying and they're right, you know, and, um, if it's without them, we don't have a district. We don't have a purpose in being. And I think the student voice has proven to really help us to understand the experiences that they are having and how they see what they need to help them to grow, to be able to do what they need to do next as well. So I feel like it's time to call the question and to find out why or what would need to change. Mm -hmm. Mr. James, you want to say something? Yes, if I if I may, um, I you I feel very I I kind of feel awkward, but kind of don't feel awkward. Um, sort of you know 
talking about this in this space, because like Dr. Rivera said, I'm not sure whether or not it's the space, but um, nonetheless, I think I think it's important. And I think it should be brought up in any space. Um, you know, I don't think I've ever said this aloud to you all, but to be quite blunt, there is a reason why I have not missed a single school committee meeting this in, the, since the beginning of my term. There's a reason why I do not sign off early, even though I get the okay that I can sign off early and that my predecessors have. I am setting a precedent. I am setting standards and I'm setting expectations. And through, through the hours of prep that I do, through going through multiple ways and reaching out to teachers and different, you know, getting therapists, guidance counselors, different aides that I can work with to sort of juggle school and school committee through everything that I do. I want, uh, everything that I do is to make a statement. And that statement is to tell you all that I can be here just as long as y'all can. And I can do the exact same work that you all can and put in the exact same work. And like Ms. Robinson said, you know, I'm ex essentially doing the exact same thing you all are doing, however, not getting a vote. And I think that while it is a matter, it, it is an issue up to the state legislator, I do think that you all, like many people who made public comments said, could use your platform to, promote the student vote and, and to push our politicians and our leaders who are in those positions to push that matter to secure for the student representative to have a vote. I think that it's long overdue. It's a battle that BSAC and other youth organizations have been fighting for over a decade. And I'm very headstrong about the matter. Um, I, I, very, I very much am. I, I said it earlier, I say it at almost every school committee meeting and I'll say it again. I will be the last student representative that didn't have a vote because there is no, there's no actual reasoning. There's no argument. There's no substantive argument that anyone can make as to why uh, the student representative should not have a vote. Thank you, Mr. James. Um, thank you, Dr. Rivera and Ms. Robinson for your comments. Um, I will um, I will take this back and um, discuss this with the vice chair. We we've had some early conversations about it. Um, like you, we we have to understand um, where we can have impact on this. So uh, we'll come back at a future meeting mm -hmm. and um, have more information about the process because I I would say that I'm I'm not very familiar with it to be. Um, quite honest and uh, I'd like to understand it better. Um, so we'll come back with something. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, anything else, any other new business? I actually okay. did have a separate matter. Um, I wanted to ask if, uh, I want to ask the superintendent if we could at some point after the um, budget season is over, probably sometime in April, to have a um, update from the um, academics. Um, give me one second. Have an update from the academics department from an, uh, Andrea Zayas's department. Um, I I spoke with her yesterday, and um, it seems as though she has um, great ideas about just you know how to sort of counteract and you know in some ways erase the punitive grading system and really move forward to make sure that students are given the the space in schools to feel as though you know the their academics and their education is theirs and that they don't have to be stressed out over it all the time so i just wanted to ask if that's possible to hear an update from her team um, sometime later in the year We'll definitely be talking about academics as part of our budget. So that will definitely be part of our ongoing conversations over the next um, several months. Excellent. Thank you so much. So uh, this concludes our business for this evening. The next school committee meeting will take place on Wednesday, February 24th at 5 p.m. And if there's nothing further, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? Thank you, second. Dr. Rivera. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, can you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes, and have a good night, everybody. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes, and good night. Mr. O'Neill? Ms. Oliver Davila. Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you.
Thank you. Good night, everybody. See you night. on February 24th. Take care.